Good evening, everybody. Um, welcome to this meeting of the City of York Council Housing and Community Safety Policy and Scrutiny Committee. Um, I'll begin by noting some apologies we've received. We've received apologies from Councillor Margaret Wells um, and Councillor Rosie Baker, uh, and don't have substitutes for either of those, those members. Um, we're expecting Councillor Vassi, um, but he has not, not arrived yet. So we are just quorate with four members. Um, were that to change, then we would not be quorate. But so we'll we'll try and make as, as as good progress as we can. But there's quite a lot on the agenda and a lot to, to talk about. Um, just as a reminder, this meeting is being being webcast. So welcome to anybody who's out there in the ether watching us. Declarations of interest. Do any members have any interest they wish to declare? <clears throat> nope, thank you. Gender item two. Um, yep, Councillor Pavlovic. Sorry, I'm, I'm not sure whether it is a pecuniary interest, um, but I work part time for the MP, and the MP is mentioned in agenda item. Uh, uh, MP requests, um, yeah. which probably mainly come from me, um, is mentioned in one of the agenda items. Okay. Thank you very much. No more declarations of interest. So agenda item two, minutes of the meeting held on the 14th of July. Um, thank you to Robert for the minutes. I've um, asked Robert to make a few presentational amendments. Are there any other matters of accuracy that members want to raise? No, so you're happy for me to sign those as an accurate record. Thank you very much. Uh, are we back to physically signing them? All yeah, yeah. oh, right, it's very exciting. I've done this for a while. Gender item three, public participation. We don't have any members of the public registered to speak today. Um, which brings us on to item four. So this is finance and performance quarter one monitor. Um, Obviously, quarter one finished some time ago, so this is a, a, a retrospective look back uh, at quarter one. Um, who'd like to introduce this, Patrick? Thanks, Chair. Uh, the report presented to the committee covers the Monitor One Finance and Performance for Housing and Community Safety Portfolio. It uses extracts of data that was considered by the executive on the 26th of August, 2021. Apologies, the report says 28th of August. That was a Saturday. That was my mistake. It was the 26th. Uh, the financial elements of the report are split between housing general fund, which are budgets that are funded from council tax and business rates, and also the housing revenue account, which is expenditure and income funded from housing rents. Across the general fund, we're currently forecasting that all services will be able to be managed within their budget. Uh, there have been a number of, sort of st uh, staffing vacancies across the services, but we're, we're satisfied that we will be able to bring that service in on budget. Uh, paragraph nine highlights the forecast lost income within the HRA that has occurred due to the time taken to get void properties into a lettable standard. Uh, about 400,000, but it's assumed that this can be managed from reduced interest charges from the HRA debt being slightly lower than forecast and interest rates being lower than assumed within the business plan. Uh, from paragraph 12, the report considers the performance information for the portfolio, and you've got plenty of officers around the table, around the room, who hopefully will be able to answer any specific performance queries that your members may have. Okay. <clears throat> Thank you for that. Obviously, we'll be at a later agenda item coming on to some, some of the aspects of service delivery performance that are mentioned in, in this report. So uh, we can maybe pick those up when we have a, a more detailed discussion on, on performance uh, in the department. But are there any questions on, on the report? Councillor Pavlovic. Thanks, Chair. Uh, I've got a few questions on different topic areas, but um, first one, uh, paragraph 11, uh, the HRA debt cap, uh, the, the HRA debt level. Um, it states that um, uh, 121.5 million was incurred as part of self-financing in 2012. 
Um, uh, the um, reserves are set aside to enable the debt to be repaid over the period 2023-24 to 2042-43. Um, so was none of the debt paid off prior to that? Or um, is, is, is that the first year of um, this debt being paid down? When, when the debt was taken out in uh, 2011, I think it was, the self-financing, uh, it was a, effectively taken out over a number of tranches which had different maturity payment dates. We haven't yet had to repay any of that money. Uh, the first one, I believe, is 24, 25. I think there's a, a debt repayment of in the region of 8 million. Uh, the final one is in 2030s. We've got quite a long period of time. Yeah. But we are certainly working on the business plan currently that will pay off debt at the time that the maturity comes out. If we can't afford to pay off the debt at that particular point in time because of decisions that have been made prior to or since, the date we took those debts, we'll do refinancing at that particular time. We have looked at whether or not we could refinance a bit earlier, but the penalties are too significant at this stage. So we'll treat them as and when the debt is required to be repaid. Thank you. Um, yep. yeah. uh, so you have kind of um, answered part of the question that I was going to ask about potentially refinancing and paying it off. Um, and one of the things you were looking at was paying it off earlier. Um, given the um, pressures on housing and um, that debt refinance, uh, that debt pay down period um, being a relatively compressed one, um, 2023 24 to 2042 43, uh, is there scope to extend it? Um, could you make it a 40 year term, for example? Uh, yes, uh, we could. As I say, as and when we come to the periods of time when we have to repay, uh, we will repay at that time and whether we need to do further borrowing, that's absolutely fine. To some extent, it's how much can the HRA afford to pay in interest levels as mm -hmm. much as anything. We're currently budgeting to spend in the region of £5 million per annum on interest. And, that's it. and unlike the general fund, we don't set money aside specifically to repay debt in as in general fund, there's a minimum revenue provision, so monies are set aside and then are used, used to repay when you require. That isn't done within the HRA and all we're showing is interest payment. And I would suggest £5 million of interest payments when total income is £30 million is the kind of level you don't particularly want it to be going up significantly more than that because the, fact the, the sort of level of rents that we're getting are kind of... Flatline. level at 30 million they'll go up slightly but you don't really want your in, your, your interest to be a greater proportion than, the, uh, than, than that level but that's an issue for members as and when business cases come forward the, the problem we do have with uh paying for social housing is if social housing paid for itself through the hra and you were able to pay for borrowing through rents every local authority, every housing HRA across the country would be building houses. It, economically, uh, social rent, it's very difficult to make it work from a financial perspective. It's obviously very good from a social perspective, but especially when you're looking at house, houses costing £200,000 to build plus land, uh, the rent that you get from those, the £800 a week, will not cover the interest on those on those costs. So that's the problem that the HRA does face. Thank you. Um, one more, then I'll... Yeah, no, absolutely. No, it's just on that. Um, so although the general fund um, sets aside a reserve, sorry, this is sounding all a bit financially geeky, um, but um, it, it, I have, it is genuinely interesting to me anyway. Um, so although the general fund does um, set aside um, a reserve to, to, to pay off its, its interest, why doesn't the HRA... Um, have that provision? Is it something that is specific to York or um, is it set down um, when the debt was um, uh, transferred to um, local authorities? No, it's, 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 it's not specific to York. In terms of the HRA, we're required by law to produce a 30-year business plan that effectively shows that the HRA is affordable and can 
uh, manage across the assumptions that it does, and that is an up, that is updated on a on a regular basis. So we we do have, and I've been at these meetings before, when we do have twenty eight million pounds in the HRA reserve. To some extent, that is money that has been set aside on the early years of uh, following the self financing mm. settlement, which was set aside to repay debt. Right. Members won't recall. Most of you won't recall that when we when the self financing settlement came about, uh, we the council was uh, providing I think it was in the region of seven million pounds to the government for the use of, of for the benefit of York having an HRA. So we were getting seven million pounds more in rents than we were paying out in expenditure. <laughs> The 121 million pounds that we then gave to the government was effectively buying that mm. cash flow that was going to be there for the next 25 to 30 years. Mm. And that was the value of that cash flow. What's happened since that time is we had austerity. Uh, we had years where uh, rents were reduced by 1% rather than going up by 2.5%. So actually the value of the debt of that 121 million pounds the revenues that we're getting aren't as great as what yeah. we had assumed back in 2011. Yeah. And so we, we, we aren't in as healthy a position as we were at the time of the self finance and settlement. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, <clears throat> just to add that, I know it's something that in the recommendations <clears throat> arising out of the piece of scrutiny work that we did and the recommendation, recommendations we approved at our last meeting, one of those relates to, I suppose, that, that kind of appetite for. Um, so potentially greater financial risk going forward in the um, housing delivery program. So that's something that we may pick up when, again, when it comes to to executive for consideration. Um, Councillor Heaton. Thank you. Um, point 15, um, look at the um, reduced net um, completions there. Um, obviously, COVID has played a big part in that. When are we looking at actually being able to get to a point we would expect to be? Because obviously things like working practices are still going on. So what's the what's the tail on that initial hit? Who would like to have a go at that? Fred, that's not a financial question no. on that one. So I have a question for Michael. So we can start the uh, housing completions on, on on the housing delivery program on site. Yeah. Top of page nine. It's actually wider than just housing delivery, it's housing completions across the city. Yeah. Uh, so that. Hmm? Time to put your mic on, Michael. So the question is specifically related to when we might see more those housing completions described in paragraph 15. Yeah, because obviously we've had a natural reduction because of COVID and as it says, they're working practices, but those working practices are obviously continuing and it's a long tail. So when when are we going to sort of like see us get back to, you know, a stronger performance as it were? Yeah. Andrew, do you want to... Do you want to <laughs> Sorry. Mike, Mike, do you want to just... Sorry, Jeff. Sorry, you advise. If you just pick up on, on the housing delivery program, I'll pick yeah. up the citywide question. Yeah, so in terms of the housing delivery program, so we're currently constructing homes at Lowfield Green. Uh, we have seen delays there associated with COVID. So different working practices, um, utility delays associated with staff being on furlough. Um, so we've seen a delay there of, of six to nine months on completion of homes. Um, we're doing our best to catch up, but you can never catch up delays that are caused by, by those factors. Um, so the, the completion of low field is, is going to be six to nine months after we originally anticipated. And on the other yeah, wider so, point. Yeah, on, the, on the wider point. So um, the, your housing market is very vibrant. Uh, so in terms of investing money going into house building programmes, I think the city's incredibly well placed from a, a national perspective to see that acceleration post COVID to recover on the, the, the pause, should we say, because of the COVID um, uh, situation. I think the challenge though for the private sector 
um, is one that we're seeing in our own delivery program and our own projects is the lack of res uh, uh, resources in terms of the, the trades and the professions, bricklayers, et cetera, uh, joiners. Uh, we've seen uh, the price volatility in materials, bricks, timber, all over the place in the last sort of three to six months. That's starting to work its way through, but clearly the, the lorry driver situation is also impacting on the, that delivery. So um, medium term, I think we're incredibly well positioned because of the housing market in York. Very short term, the next three to six months, all the construction industry is really struggling with the volatility in materials and the demand for resources. So I don't expect a reco recovery immediately, but certainly from a York perspective, long term, absolutely. So then if we can sort of open up the taps and you know create that situation, then we will be able to... We yeah, start to see up. the appetite through the planning process chair um, the appetite through uh, for developers to invest money in the city um, is, is is probably a, from my perspective it, it's really buoyant it's really buoyant um, just okay. one yeah. on a different topic but um, point 22 this, I expect this will have come up um, more across the city but um, when we're looking there at um, the access to the broadband um there have been a number of issues where the infrastructure's gone in, but then there's not been the ability to actually sign on to the broadband. Um, now, I've raised this a few times elsewhere. Um, so what is the spe specific element of access there? Is it the infrastructure or is it the ability to sign on? The, my, my understanding, Chair, is that the, the infrastructure passes that percentage of streets and therefore it's the, that's the opportunity. Uh, if you've got specific references about the inability to sign off on, yeah. please do let me know because, sure. I can, because we do have contacts with the companies that have laid the infrastructure and would be interested to understand. They're the ones who have been very what, slow. Yeah, yeah. yeah, so I'd be interested yeah. to understand what the barriers are. Yeah, okay, thanks. No, I think I, <clears throat> I can contribute a few of those examples where the trench has been dug, and but the <laughs> companies won't come and physically connect, connect it. And it's very frustrating for residents who yeah, have been looking forward to it. And then, but, no. <laughs> give me the details and, oh, we, well, could, and yes. we can start to have a look at that from a, a broader uh, issue. Uh, immediately, what springs to mind is that they're under the same pressure for, yeah. for, for resources yeah. and labour at the moment, but yeah. clearly I need to confirm that and we can feed that back so you can talk to your residents on that basis. Yeah. Thank you. Um, are there any further questions? Councillor Padwick. Thanks, Chair. Um, the data set in paragraph 14, um, uh, it's... Uh, a number of them relate to um, quarter two, um, 2020, 2021. Um, now, obviously, we're well into 21, 22. Um, but the full year data for 2021 um, was available in August um, for net additional homes, net housing consents, um, and house, uh, homeless households. Um, and for relet uh, empty properties, um, in October 2021. Uh, would it be possible, and, and I'm not asking you to give us these figures now, um, but would it be possible for, um, once that data is available, um, for you to email members of the committee? Um, members um, have access to all this data on the KPI hub. Uh, it's updated on a weekly basis. So it's live information at any particular point in time. So. Uh, we can certainly. So, uh, could somebody point me in the direction of the KPI hub? <laughs> because um, that's the first. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, just for everybody's information, the council operates an internal performance indicator uh, database uh, that's available for access for members. So, uh, yeah, if you. Can yeah, we can send you that. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Yeah. And, uh, so, no, 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 no. So agreed action to send, send us a link. Par paragraph 26. Does highlight the your open data dot org, but yeah, uh, I'm sure I'll I'll ask Mr. Cunningham from, from the yes. performance team. <clears throat> and Good. there is a section which just looks has housing and community safety scrutiny, so it's yeah. 
will provide all the details for this particular committee. No, that's a helpful reminder of what, what information is available. So thank you for that. Any further questions, members on that agenda item? No, thank you, Patrick, for that. Um, agenda item five, housing service impacts of Brexit and COVID. Um, <clears throat> so this is from pages 15 to 20 in the in the agenda pack. Um, it's a, uh, I think a sort of re re refreshingly um, straightforward and honest assessment of of issues that I know many of us as, as councillors are not um, su surprised at because we um, receive queries and, and questions from residents, um, but it, it's really helpful to have it set out for us um, so, so clearly. So what we're asked to do um, for this agenda item is to hear from officers within the service on how COVID restrictions and Brexit um, have impacted and how the performance issues for the service are being addressed going forward. And in particular, there's um, an action plan is set out and I'm sure that members will want to, to discuss both um, the issues that the service has, has, has encountered recently, but also uh, more importantly, how we propose to, to move forward. Um, so who would like to introduce this report? Michael. Thank you, Chair. Um, the author of this report was Tracy Carter, who unfortunately can't be here today. So um, I'm going to run through um, what changed as a result of COVID and Brexit, talk about a few other things that are happening within the housing service, um, what's gone well, despite some of those challenges, but some of the service level impacts. Um, and then I'm going to hand over to Mike Gilson and Dennis Southall, who are going to talk about the action plans for their service areas, which are are most affected by what I'm going to talk about. So um, it resulted in a, a significant reduction in our ability to undertake repairs across the service. This has created a, a pent up demand as services have reopened. Um, so Mike, I'm sure we'll talk to you in a bit more detail about how the, the demand across the service is normally smoothed out and how we work to create a, a a manageable workflow throughout the year. Um, that's not been possible due to the kind of peaks and troughs of, of lockdown and, the re and restrictions being lifted. Um, alongside that, a lot of the work that Mike's team done does has been much more time consuming. So that's both answering phone calls, going through COVID safety checks, and also the trades people going out and about their business, um, going into people's homes where rightly people want to be reassured that we're, we're operating safely and we've got a, a duty to keep our staff safe alongside that. Uh, we've seen some supply chain issues, so um, some lack of availability of materials, some increase in cost of materials, some greater difficulty in getting third party contractors to undertake work. Um, any of us who have been trying to get any work done in our own homes will have seen the greater difficulty of getting tradespeople into our homes at the moment, there's, there's lots of demand um, and no increase in capacity. Um, from a recruitment perspective, we've had some difficulties in recruiting staff to key services, housing management, housing options, and also tradespeople within Mike's team. Um, the government rules changed how we can recover costs. So some of the the tools at our disposal about um, collecting rents were temporarily um, suspended, which meant that we had to operate in a slightly different way, which has had impacts. Um, the everyone in policy, which was very successful, but that created some additional cost and resource requirements to support our homeless residents. Um, and alongside that, we've also seen some increase in demand for social housing. So alongside those changes, um, we've been trying to implement a new housing ICT system, which has meant resource has um, moved across to support in the implementation of that programme, which in the long term will create lots of efficiencies and improvements in the service, but in the short term um, requires resource of staff. We've had some managerial change, some managerial losses. Um, there's been a restructure within the service um, which has all created some, some greater challenges in terms of, in terms of managing, managing the service over the last 18 months or so. 
Um, we've also seen the impact of welfare reform and changes um, which have been ongoing as a result of austerity now for a number of years. So despite some of those challenges, there's, there's been some great progress in housing. So the housing delivery program, well fields continue to progress well. Uh, we've received planning permission for Burnham and Duncan Barracks, and we've got a planning application ready to go in for Ordnance Lane to deliver some much needed new affordable housing. In terms of the older person's accommodation program, we completed Marjorie Wake Court. We handed over Haxby Hall Care Home. Um, and Mike's team also undertook some um, important fire safety works at Delwood. We've initiated the retrofit program and achieved significant grant funding income. Uh, we've also um, devised a new customer engagement approach where we've got an enhanced tenant satisfaction survey to go out this year to have a greater understanding of residents' priorities that can feed into future business plans. Um, and the ICT programme um, has progressed well and should be implemented in November, which will bring a real benefit for both staff and residents in terms of being able to um, work with us in a more efficient way. So some of the, the negatives, some of the impacts that we've seen in the service, um, I'll run through these in a very high level, quick way, um, and then hand over to Mike and Dan for a bit more detail. So housing waiting list has gone up. We've had more people registering. Um, we've got a backlog of new applications. Um, our demand around homeless presentations has remained high. The Homeless Reduction Act has created complexity around that. We've had an increase in rent arrears due to changes in how we are able to collect rent. So that's gone up from about 975K in March to 1.25 million at the moment. Uh, we've got a backlog of repairs and maintenance tasks in some trades, but not all. So within some trades, we're able to respond within our service level agreement, but some trades um, are taking longer and we've got more of a backlog to work through. Um, Impact around resources and getting people into empty properties has meant that we've got more voids at the moment. So um, we've got an average of about 72. We'd actually like it to be a bit less than that, but at the moment we've got over 150 um, void properties. We've had some impacts on our plan maintenance programme in terms of reduced ability to get into people's homes and undertake important maintenance works. Um, Mike's team has seen a, a massive um, challenge around reporting repairs. Um, so the number of repair calls that we've been able to answer has, has been a challenge because each call is now taking longer. Um, so we've, we're losing more repair phone calls than we have previously, which has lent to more complaints or more resource impacts on that side. Um, and we've got a, a a lot of resources is going to, into vital everyday services, which has meant that we've got a little bit less capacity for some projects that we'd like to have progressed, such as at Glen Lodge and at Bell Farm. Um, but before I hand over to Mike and Dan, I'd just like to say that, you know, this isn't a York issue, this is a national issue. So whilst the challenges are significant, um, we've got plans around it, where our conversations with our peers are that everyone else is facing the same challenges. Others have reduced their services to only essential repairs. Um, some have communicated to residents that repair times will go up. Um, some haven't been making any new repair appointments and have been just saying that we're gonna deal with the backlog first. That's not been our approach at this stage. We've been trying to keep things going as good as we can. Um, and on the whole, we're, we're doing a decent job but there's, there's obviously some significant challenges uh, that I outlined. So I'll hand over to Dan and Mike to take you through our action plan to, to resolve them. Thank you, Michael. I, so I should have said, if, when officers speak, if you can just um, say your job title as well, just so those watching know who we all are. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, I'm Mike Gerson. I'm Try again. Hi, I'm Mike Gilston, Head of Building Services. Um, in old language, that's 
the repairs and maintenance head. Um, uh, thanks, Michael, for outlining some of those uh, challenges for us. Uh, what I would uh, like to um, start just by saying is that, as you can see, there's been some very difficult challenges for us right across the piece. However, what I would like to say right at the start is that for the team there, they have worked <coughs> extremely hard to deliver a service 365 days a year, 24 seven, all the way through the pandemic from March 16th when it started. They worked through all of that. Um, and just to deliver that has taken an incredible amount of effort and determination um, for people to do that. And a lot, of, a, lot of, a lot of thinking about what we're gonna do and how we do it, how we prioritize things. Um, just some of the background to some of the, these things from, from the start of the pandemic. Um, within, within something like three weeks, we transferred our uh, in-house call center to home working. Everybody that could work at home was moved home. Um, at the same time, we had to review all of our processes, so every single trade activity and risk assess it and put a new method statement in place. So that's hundreds of different activities that we had to do all within the short term uh, in order to carry on actually providing a service seamlessly for people in terms of the emergency service and urgent, urgent works. Now, um, also, if people remember back to some of the, the, I mean, there was a general feeling across the council we, that we're going to do our best for people. Um, things like, remember, there was everyone in, if people remember that campaign, to make sure there was no street homeless. And our team were part of that process, and they worked um, tirelessly to make sure there was no, in that, those first few weeks, actually there was nobody sleeping on the streets and stuff like that. Now, there was some great work done there. However, some of that work did start to, early indications start to cause some of the problems. So, for example, in terms of us, if you like, uh, overextending our capacity, looking after these emergency voids, which was, um, and then at the same time, building a, a backlog of the existing void properties that were coming through the system, kind of coming up. And one of the biggest challenges for us on the void side is that we have a, a certain level of capacity. So for example, our general capacity is about uh, between nine and 10 voids per week. But if you have, if you have 20 come in, You've, you've got to step up really quickly or that builds up to a backlog and then that goes, that compounds uh, week on week. And one of the challenges that we had it, it was, was, was not being able to keep pace with that, that, um, those volume of uh, voids. And of course, the first, the first four months of the year were really around, focused around only getting through those emergency, um, those emergency lets. So we were talking about emergency lets around domestic violence, uh, uh, around persecution, all sorts of things, you know, the, you know, the, um, that we, uh, we picked up there. The, um, uh, and what, what we found with the reactive repair side of things, which um, um, people have heard a lot about, was that through the first part of the year when we were, just a bit be clear and also for anybody watching here, in terms of the decision about not undertaking um, uh, routine works and only emergency works that was a government directive for all organ all housing organizations it was uh, very clear that that's what, what was expected of us um so uh, so for the first four months we we dealt with uh, urgent and emergency repairs and then with the expectation that once that once things the lockdown um, uh, kind of eased off a bit is that we'd start to see repairs come through but actually what happened was it wasn't quite like that actually it was quite quite for a while. And what we did start to see is through, through July and through August and through September, we start to see a real significant increase in terms of volumes of calls coming through. And if, if, if you imagine in our general, you know, most organizations have kind of, you have a, you set a level of capacity with some flexibility built in for, with subcontractors to deal with um, uh, flexing in demands. But what we found once that wave started to come, it was peaking over even our flex capacity, if you, if you like, and that's where we start to have things um, um, start to build up a backlog. And what we saw is over a, a period of probably four or five months, something a backlog of something like 6,000 jobs build up in the system. And the only way that we can deal with those jobs in the way that we, at that time, was actually to push some of those jobs off a little bit further. And we were, we were mess you know, providing messages to, to, to residents about things would take a little bit longer, but it did mean some of that was quite lengthy for, uh, for, um, for residents. Um, now, uh, so that was probably, the, in terms of voids, was a similar sort of thing. Um, and uh, and what, we've, what we have done is, as a consequence of that is bringing some more resource. 
for both reactive repairs and, and, and pretty much across all of our key trades in terms of subcontractor support and also on the voids. The voids has been a more complex, uh, a complex challenge in terms of the way that demand has come through to the service. We've looked at process. We've, we're currently in the, in the middle of a, a review that's, that's highlighting all sorts of different things. As, as we expect any review, review, there's different ways and better ways of doing things. Um, it also uh, started to highlight some of the challenges we've had about properties where they're in poorer condition when we take them over. So that's impacting things. But when it came down to it, the core, the core thing that we needed to do around voids was about resource. And if, if you imagine, I'm sure many of you would think about how do we get building work done more quickly? In a, in a traditional way, you flood the pro property with labor. That's what you do. And we weren't able to do that because of social distancing, because of the uh, COVID safe measures and things like that. So we were kind of limited in our responses. What we've done more belatedly is bring on additional contractors is uh, we're bringing in support for the, the team there in terms of we're moving one of our team leaders over to support the team leader in voids. We're putting a voids coordinator in there to deal with some of the administration with the contractors, the increased number of contractors. Um, uh, and also we've increased the number of electricians, we've increased the number of people working on heating that are going into those, into those uh, properties. And probably more, uh, moreover is that we've done more collective work with, with Dennis's team to make sure we'd, we're working in a more joined up way. So there are weekly meetings of those teams, reviewing where we're at, pushing in the right direction um, uh, to resolve some of those uh, issues. Um, in terms of some of the things around the, uh, the action plan, sorry, just tell me, Dan, you tell me if, I have to, if I'm going on too long. Um, well, no, <clears throat> so, don't feel the need to read through every aspect. No, I'm not going to go through everything. So, <laughs> so what? So, um, so what? I've, I've talked about the, uh, the the main one of the main things is about bringing an additional resource uh, to us to assist the, assist the team. Um, um, we're also is in terms of the way that we work with our uh, contact centre. So we brought in three additional staff into our contact centre in order to, because one of the impacts was about people not being able to get through. Um, and we've looked at ways in which we can uh, triage, triage that work through the call centre um, and also manage people's expectations. And sometimes that does mean when we're having conversations with customers, we're saying, unfortunately, we're not going to be able to get to you, for, you know, as quickly as we'd like, but here's the day and we can have conversations around that. And, and, for, and I'd like to thank, you know, the patience of lots of residents in terms of having to wait that bit longer. But uh, we have prioritised um, the emergency uh, uh, side of things. So, for example, one of the things that we, I think the service should be proud of is that in terms of things like gas servicing, we've maintained a 99.567% rate of gas servicing, which is, when you look at our peers kind of thing, actually we've done really well, just making sure that people are safe and things, same things around electrical testing programs that we started and, and also the fire safety things. Um, so we've, um, we really struggled with the, the recruiting vacancies, just to give you a flavor of that. We made three attempts to recruit three joiners and with zero recruits at the end of that process. And we tried everything. We literally tried everything in terms of where we advertised. We were putting um, job adverts in, in uh, building suppliers around the city. We we're getting all of our guys to, to chase down uh, um, their kind of contacts and things like that. And we're still not getting there. It's only belatedly really in the last few months that through a joint campaign with HR and a number of different ways of thinking about it, that we've actually started to um, get, um, get recruits in. But that has impacted because some of the joinery is one of the key functions within the void work. So that also impacted. Uh, within that then of course we've had the uh, the issue of our, our own um, absenteeism it, it seems unfair to say to absenteeism person but people who've got covid and they're having to self-isolate um, but yes that did impact us more bel more belatedly really than in the early days and that's just added in added into things so we've improving on the uh, 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 the voice process we're improving in terms of the uh, the resource levels that we're putting in there uh, both in terms of the management and administration of voids, but also in the, in the trade side, um, that we're putting more resource into the, the contact centre to do that. Um, we're also being able to leverage some of our work on our plan contractors to support the reactive repair side. Um, and we'll be working through uh, um, uh, each of our different service areas in, in the ways in which, how can each of those service areas help to contribute to the key areas of reactive repairs and voids? Uh, to support through that. Um, one of the things that we do need to, uh, we do acknowledge that we need to improve on, and that's messaging to our residents. 
so so that, that, so that they're clear what we what we can and what we can't do and why we're doing it and when we're doing it. Those key messages that we have put some of that out in terms of when people read through in terms of social media and, and, and the website and stuff like that. But I think we do need to uh, in, uh, improve in that area. Um, I think I'll probably stop there because I'm sure you've got lots of questions. So I'm sure we have. <laughs> uh, Dennis, is there anything you'd like to add? Yes, uh, Dennis Seth, I'm head of housing management and housing options. Okay, very similar picture to Mike. So uh, following uh, adjusting to the uh, pandemic and the lockdowns, we've seen a similar similar pattern of demand pent up demand coming out um, uh, now that we're out of um, the latest lockdown impacts on uh, staff health as well. And as is detailed in the report, the ping, pandemic and uh, more recently, more instances of COVID than we've ever had, to be honest with you. Um, like Mike, I'd like to commend the efforts of staff throughout that, they've worked throughout um, the pandemic, whether it's staffing our supported accommodation, taking homeless presentations, letting homes, um, or dealing with some of the issues that residents have had, as well as keeping them safe. We focused on uh, an approach which was around keeping frontline services running and uh, as accessible as possible, keeping staff safe and well informed and as happy as possible. Uh, trying to keep performance against targets as usual and keeping our communities well informed and supported, um, which I think we've been on the whole successful at. Um, you've seen the uh, current performance levels which we're at, and um, uh, as has been indicated, the, uh, the, the forthcoming implementation of the IT system is going to have uh, a further impact on that with lots of staff testing, training, go live uh, of, a, of a major IT system of replacing 17 existing IT systems um, when we press the button on go live, which will be in two stages, by the way, it'll be in November and in February next year. So um, one of the things that we've done in response to this is to sort of split out the risk uh, of going live with absolutely everything. To make make sure um, we we spread any impact because as you know when when you do turn on an IT system it never works entirely perfectly particularly something as complex as what as uh, the one we're going to be working with in the in the future um, what we're we doing about it um, triaging is the name of the game so we're focusing on what's most important to our customers and. Uh, the people in the most need. Um, we're having to deprioritize some of those issues um, that are not um, uh, uh, urgent. Um, so making sure that the, the applications for, in particular, our gold bank categories, so that homeless families, people who, who can't return home for, for hospital, from hospital, for example, that's actually emergency band, which, which is above gold band. Um, and uh, cases coming through resettlements, obviously uh, keeping uh, uh, temporary accommodation available um, for people, homeless families coming in is, is extremely important. We're expanding that uh, it, by reopening Crombie House, um, which uh, was, was closed down and was due for redevelopment. Um, uh, as, as James House came online, um, Obviously, we're, we're hoping that um, uh, empty homes will, will become available by building services, and we're geared up to, um, to, to let those as quickly as possible. Um, as Mike has indicated, we're working together, communicating effectively week in, week out to prioritise the most urgent cases, um, try and be as flexible as we can with the resources that we've got. Um, and again, in housing management work, it's looking at the most important things, letting those new homes, progressing urgent moves, um, supporting people in financial difficulty, particularly with the ending of the universal credit uplift and what's happening with um, fuel bills, very topical for this evening, um, and, and obviously tackling uh, serious a ASB. So uh, on many of those things, we rely on our partners uh, to help us out with those uh, services within, within the council and partners externally. Um, so obviously we're, we're communicating that 
One of the things that we're working on is a more detailed communications plan uh, overall. So um, getting messages out to people <coughs> like yourselves, the councillors, stakeholders, partner organisations, um, just so that they are absolutely up to date on where we're at um, and the sort of services that we can deliver and what we need to expect from them as well. So uh, that, that's in hand as well. Um, I think I'll end at that point. I, hopefully that gives you a flavour of that and you've got some questions. Yeah. Um, thank you, Dennis. Um, Neil, is there anything else you want to add? Yeah, uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, I mean, I'll say it on their behalf, and, you know, a big thank you from me to Tracy, who's not here, but to Michael, Dan and, and Mike, in terms of the embracing of an open and transparent management culture within the housing team. Uh, they're all very proud of their workforce and the work that they do on a day-to-day -day basis. They've identified these problems within their service area. They've come up with the, the gaps that in terms of that service performance, then none of them are happy with the deteriorating situation. But they've come up with, uh, they've identified this, the challenge, they've identified options for recovery. We're putting that recovery plan in place. We'll be monitoring that recovery plan. We'll be reviewing it. And as we turn that around, we'll be reporting that back to yourself. So, you know, a big thank you from me to the team for that open and transparent way that we're trying to manage these issues. And I hope we can embrace that with yourselves to keep that dialogue going as to how we how we progress this on behalf of our residents and the, and the residents of York. <clears throat> thank you for that. And, and I, I certainly echo the <clears throat> appreciation for the Sort of transparency in this report and i'm sure it's an issue we'll want to continue to to work with officers to to add value where we can and ultimately um represent the needs and interests of the the residents that that we all we all serve in our various capacities um i'll open it up for questions and comments from from members i'll start with a quick question from me on the paragraph three top of page 16 <clears throat> um Mention was made of, of difficulties with recruitment, particularly in certain trades, uh, which I know is, is not unique to, to the housing maintenance sector. But the sixth bullet point talks about vacancy controls during COVID. So I just wondered <clears throat> how those two things fit together if we're struggling with recruitment, but then there's a, a block on recruitment. I just wondered if you could just explain a bit more what, what was going on with those two things happening in parallel. Thanks. Um, um, sorry, Mike Wilson speaking again. Um, my understanding was that there wasn't an absolute block on recruitment. There wasn't just a blanket block. In terms of, there was, um, in terms of clear, clearly, if there's key resources that you need to put in place, there was a route through, my understanding, that you could recruit through those, those periods. Um, yeah, thank you. So uh, clearly last year, um, the council was suffering from a huge loss of revenue. So in my own director place, uh, we have 20 million pounds worth of revenue comes into the authority, 7 million from parking, for example. I think there's over, over 20 million coming in, in a year through, through the housing revenue account. Uh, you know, significant revenues, and they were all at risk last year, and, and we were waiting. We had the uh, government undertaking interventions, giving us grants, etc. From a uh, CMT perspective, we undertook a, a, an exercise in making sure that we understood what we were recru recruiting to and why we were recruiting to those positions as we were looking at controlling costs and controlling the risk last year. I think Mike's correctly conveyed there was no block on recruitment. We were making sure that vital services such as the housing teams were supported in terms of the recruitment process, but it did in 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 in, in necessitate is the right word I'm looking for, necessitate uh, an additional uh, hurdles in the process to ensure that we, from a CMT perspective, were comfortable with the levels of employment that we were moving forward with last year. Is that a supplementary, Councillor Pavlovic? That is. Um, uh, but before I go on to my supplementary, I, I, I do want to say um, that the teams and yourselves have worked incredibly hard throughout this pandemic. Um, and certainly there's no criticism from, um, certainly from my part, um, about the work that people have done when they've been able to do it. Um, and so 
I'm going to direct all of my questions to the corporate director because I think um, that's what you're paid for, um, frankly. Um, so you say that um, you had to then make decisions um, in respect of um, adequate staffing levels. Um, you must have recognised before the budget was set in, um, in February 2021 um, that there were significant problems within housing repairs. This, this 6,000 backlog, um, as Mike has described, um, it was building throughout the start of the pandemic. So we, we had problems um, in maintenance, housing repairs, um, the voids. But yet you still then chose to both put a hold on, um, on recruitment because um, in paragraph four it says, cumulative impact of budget savings, staffing reductions over time. Um, so at the same time that you've um, acknowledged that there's a problem, you've also overseen the reduction of the resources within that staff team. Um, how do those two things square? And, and, and then I do want to ask you a, a, a second question, but it is a supplementary to the question that um, Councillor Fenton raised. So the, the first point is that what I was referring to was the period of last year in terms of the uh, vacancy control measures that we had in place as a CMT. As we progress towards budget for this financial year, uh, we were not aware of any particular issues in respect of the housing revenue accounts budgetary position in order to provide sufficient resources to undertake the work that was planned for the coming year. I think in terms of the point there about the, the longer term reduction in the level of employment that uh, in staffing within the service area that happened before I took responsibility for the service last October. Clearly, this year, as we've come out of COVID, one of the issues has been recruiting those staff. It's not a budgetary mm -hmm. issue. It's, a, it's And this is something I'm experiencing elsewhere in the organisation. Really difficult to get hold of staff. I've got the budgets. I've got sufficient to deliver, but I haven't got the, the, the ability to recruit to those positions. I think clearly you're right to highlight that with this backlog, and the bud upcoming budgetary process and the envelope within the HRA, there's a question of actually acceleration before we get back to performance levels that we would expect. And one of the things that was in the report at about talking about external contractors to bring that existential resource to bear, we've got to take that, edit, how long that will make, need to persist in order for us to get into a recovery position. So when I said in my piece there about reviewing, we are going to review as to how quick the recovery is happening and what that means for the budget process. I think then there will be a question clearly for executive and council to decide as to well, how quickly do you want that recovery to happen uh, in respect of the re reflecting that in particular in the current circumstances it's not all about the money it's actually about the ability to recruit its ability to get all the materials I don't know if there's any additional points you would like to make because from a, from your perspective as providing the service gentlemen um yeah I'm, I'm sorry I was just going to say sorry um just on on that one one of the things I would say about the, the way of the backlogs are built up and things like that it was it was very it's really difficult to predict how that was going to go if you just look across the sector uh, um, for, for you know building in terms of local and local government and housing associations even now the kind of responses as part of the you know my kind of prepare, preparation for this meeting looking at something like 30 of our peers and there's such a diverse range of kind of responses and and, and clearly based on where people think it's going to go or they and the, the and really it was it was very difficult so for example so uh, in in york we, st we started undertaking routine repairs again in June. The minute that we, we saw a chink of light, we started, we started going for them again and opened up, and opened up the, the phone lines for people to do that because we thought it was important to get back, on, back onto that work. But for some organisations, actually, for some organisations, I think Michael kind of, uh, uh, sort of intimated in some of those things, that literally only a few months ago started undertaking routine repairs again. 
So it, it, I think if that's kind of reflective of yeah, yeah, different organisations are going to take different choices, but people say, well, where is this going to, where is this going to go? And once, and when you're in the thick of that, it's very difficult to think where you're going to go. And that's, and I think that 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 means the challenge of actually, because if you're thinking about we're we're booking work, you know, sometime in advance, and the, and then trying to put, get the right resources in, in the, in a very rapidly changing uh, uh, situation. I mean, as well, as well, I suppose when we look back, there was three lockdowns. It was, it was, it was, it was like a, a roller coaster, wasn't it? Through, through those periods, to, and then to try and mold and mold and shape complex services around that. I think it's, it, we probably have to reflect on that, saying actually that was quite a significant challenge, and probably out of most of our experiences in all of our walks of life about trying to manage that. <clears throat> Did you have a, a supplementary or a substantive question to follow? Microphone. Sorry, sorry, Chair. Um, I'm not sure whether it's a supplementary or whether it's a substantive. Anyway, so anyway. uh, <laughs> just say, fill your boots. Uh, you see, I, I absolutely, I absolutely hear all that, and I totally understand the complexity of the scenario that you were that that you found yourselves in. But six thousand case backlog, um, 159 um, uh, voids. That has a, a, you know, we've just heard, we've just heard about the HRA um, from Patrick. You know, if we're not getting those rents in, that impacts on the HRA bottom line. Um, now, I don't want to say, um, as, a, you know, as we are the scrutiny committee, um, and policy committee, the policy should be get the voids done first um, and get those um, get those relet because that has then a consequence on the um, on the repairs. But the, the, there's a fundamental issue, and and and, and there's you know in, in paragraph four it says increasing volume of FOIs, MPs, letters, and council inquiries. Well, there's a reason for that, and the reason for that is that people are in despair. People. People are incredibly unhappy, and more than unhappy, they are very concerned about their health as much as anything else. Um, I've, and, and you know, my best Jeremy Corbyn. Um, I will. I'll talk about two two specific cases I dealt with today, um, and you know, Mike, I've, I've emailed regarding one of them. Um, a chap contacted me in June saying um, I've got uh, a problem with my plumbing, the toilet's, um, the toilet's leaking, um, there's, um, what's the word, effluent um, that's leaking. Um, it's now July, it still hasn't been um, fixed. So I contacted um, customer service, it took me 20 minutes to get through to, um, on, the, on the customer service line. And she said, oh, sorry, yes, we did have it, but it wasn't marked down as an emergency. Um, oh, yeah, we can't have, uh, we can't have leaking, uh, we can't have a leaking toilet. Um, we'll send somebody around within, um, well, b before nine o'clock tonight. And sure enough, they did. Um, the plumber then says, I'm sorry, we're, we're going to have to condemn this, this whole bathroom. Um, it's not just the toilet. The bath's backing up. Um, you can't empty the um, the bath, and there's waste that's coming up through the the bath hole. He was told it was going to be done in August. August came, August went. Um, he's now not been given any sort of date whatsoever for this for this piece of um, for, for this work to do. In the meantime, he's got a bath that he can't use. Um, he's got a toilet that still doesn't work. Now, if he was a private tenant um, and he contacted, um, he contacted our housing standards team, they would have been onto that private landlord like a dose of salt and saying, you have got to do this. This, this um, resident, this tenant can't live in these conditions. It's unhygienic, it's unsafe, get on with it or we will enforce. But because of a council tenant, they get a second rate service and that is no that is no i am not criticizing the staff team when they're able to go out there i'm talking about the resourcing 
um, the, the backlog of 6,000 jobs. Council tenants, because you've got them as a captive audience, they can't, they can't say, oh, well, I'll just go and find another private tenancy. They're stuck in having to live in the conditions that they're having to live with, whether it's leaking toilets, whether it's damp on the walls, and this needs to be a priority. And I know that you've just reflected um, that it's down to executive um, um, and, and, and it's down to councillors to, to set the uh, budgetary priorities. And I will be making the same points that I'm making today on Thursday at full council. Um, but we cannot say that council tenants should be allowed to have a second class service um, and that's 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 um that's something that that we as an authority should have as actually our shame um not a sense of uh, not a sense of pride and that's notwithstanding the work that the the teams can do you know they're working with one hand tied behind their backs in my opinion so just <clears throat> supposed to, to add to that does that what does that suggest in terms of that we've heard talk about triaging and <clears throat> I suppose it poses a question, what are the parameters that are set when a decision is made as to whether a, um, a requested repair is, is purely aesthetic or in, in cases such as that referred to is, is a fairly fundamental issue which has a material impact on someone's ability to actually use use their home i don't know whether that yeah, is something that anybody wants to yeah I could, do that. I, I could entirely agree councillor public entirely unacceptable for someone to have a bathroom where there is effectively um effluent uh, coming out through through the through the bath uh, we'll, obviously i'm sure michael take the details from you and we'll look into that particular instance I think when what I can reflect on in terms of the position we're in and what I've said this evening is nobody from the officer corps is happy with the level of service we're providing at the moment. That has been recognised as a deteriorating situation. It's in response partly to Brexit, it's partly in response to COVID. Uh, at this moment in time, it's not a budgetary issue, but clearly in terms of the pace of recovery, it may become a budgetary mm -hmm. issue when we take a, a view as to how how much money we're chewing through to catch back up but again i think it's a credit to to mike den and, and michael that actually they've not been content though nobody's trying to shovel this under the a stone and pretend it's not happening and we'll recover in in secret this is about actually a managerial uh, culture that myself and tracy are absolutely trying to uh, inculcate across the whole housing team and uh, and that is effectively to be open and transparent with yourself as members be open and transparent with our residents uh, when we're not getting it right we should say we're not getting it right we should put an action plan in place to get it back on track this report to executive and then here to you to, here tonight is a recognition of it's not right now and it needs to be put right and i think that that's where you know from my perspective and you you rightly I can't put, made me accountable for the whole service, which I am. That is my approach to making uh, any of my services. We recognise where we're not, where we're failing. We 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 identify the, by the gap. We put options in place, and we, then we undertake the recovery. My challenge to yourselves as, as scrutiny is effectively to hold us to account on that recovery curve because it's got to be at pace. Because what we can't have. Is residents such as you've described uh, in an ongoing situation it's, it's it's bad in terms of the position we're in now we've got a recovery place we need to make sure that the numbers of residents that's, that are in those circumstances drop significantly so we get back to the service level we would expect if we were a tenant of the council thank you, <clears throat> thank you neil uh councillor vassi thank you chair um yeah i'd like to go back to the lack of joiners for a minute and and rehearse the elephant in the room here if i've understood it correctly are you saying that the shortage of joiners is in part down to brexit and the reason i ask that is because if we try to recruit we we have a number of things to worry about short term medium term long term recruitment uh, we have to think about, is it just that people don't want to work for the council? 
or is it that there aren't the skill sets in the country to do the work because uh, a number of people who used to do the work are no longer in the country and not working here. And we need to be honest and clear about it um, because to address it requires facing up to where the, where the problem lies. And if the problem does lie with Brexit, then plainly we have to think about training. We have to think about what we're doing beyond this area and how the council is engaging with encouraging training, vocational training, training in skills. Um, and, and so and my first question is, uh, is it about Brexit? Are we doing something to work to encourage vocational training and new skills in the trades, if it is? Uh, Who'd like to have a go? Uh, I'll, I'll, yeah. I'll do the, the first bit and then I'll pass to my... Uh, I'm not going to step into the bear trap, which is politically <laughs> Brexit. I think what we can report as officers to you, which is our role, is that there is a shortage of skilled trades, particularly in the building sector. Um, as to what's causing that, I'll, I'll let you debate that at, at your leisure. But that is the impact on your council, your services as of today. And, and I think in terms of your training question, I passed to, to Mike because I absolutely agree with the point you were making in respect of the need to train. Yeah, hi, um, I'm not going to go into that Brexit debate either. Uh, um, I, I think what, one of the things I would say is that we, we do recognise the issues around training. And so one of the things that we've been working alongside the housing delivery program, for example, is looking to the uh, for our, our guys to be receive training around the installation of air source heat pumps, the installation of uh, photovoltaic you know, solar panels, the kind of maintenance of those pieces of kit, the kind of overview of, of kind of working with those things. So we're starting that process. It's low level. We've, we've been able to benefit through our relationship with the housing delivery team around some of that stuff in terms of working with the retrofit academy and, and, and some of those bodies. So there's some of that kind of stuff. I mean, more positively, actually, one of the things right through the last period is that we've had uh, we've got a program of 16 apprentices coming through building services, which is the largest glug of apprentices. 15, sorry. Yeah, 15. But, um, it, the longest club of apprentices in a long time through building services. So we've, we're, we're, we're at about seven now in terms of where we're working through. And those, those young people are doing wonders. And, um, and what a time to come into an organisation. They, they literally started at the beginning of lockdown. And, and have worked for, so, but the, in terms of working, we're working through with those, um, those, those apprentices. So, and working in ways, methods in which we can maximize our chances and making sure those apprentices are gonna stop with us um, uh, when they get their qualifications and things like that. So, so I think a combination, it's, it's, it's early days, but it's, it's, it's a significant change in terms of our approach to apprenticeships. Um, and also that, that opening up about that kind of the, the way the new world's going to be, you know, around where we're talking about the new homes where they're, they're going to be passive houses and things like that, where we're going to need these skill sets and we start to develop that and we'll do much more work around that. And that's one of our key, kind of, it's not in there in terms of our actions to this, but it, it's, it's certainly going to be a core thing for us. Thank you. Thank can, you. can I just yeah. quickly respond? Yeah. I want to be clear that the reason why I, I mentioned the elephant in the room is it's about the clarity about whether we simply have a bunch of people who don't want to work for the council, but the skills exist, or whether there are skills we need. And I think the point you've just made there as well about uh, retrofit, about zero carbon housing, passive standard, all that stuff, there are plainly new skills that are going to be needed anyway. Um, but the, the question is, uh, as well, whether there's a shortage uh, and, and how we're going to flood that. Because if there's simply a lack of people with the skill set, there comes a point where it doesn't matter how much money you're offering. If people don't have the skill set, you're not going to fill the vacancies. And that's what I was yeah. trying to uh, That's a really valid point, Councillor Bassey. Yeah, this, this, the demand in terms of for these skills is incredibly high. So therefore, you know, we're competing in a, in a supply and demand situation. So therefore the attractiveness of the council because of our, our collective agreements and making sure that we've got a parity of pay across the piece and our ability to respond, you know, as to we need a joiner this week. Well, what do we, what we prepare to pay? We're not in that market, but clearly the building sector is the more generally and those skills are in demand. That is ref being reflected in the prices uh, that people are being paid. I think there is a, a longer term issue. There's two longer term issues, and I think you're right to 
to slot it up into those pieces is in the immediate term, there's the recruitment, there's the training. In the, in the medium term, there's uh, wage inflation and how that impact, in, might impact differentially around the authorities' uh, services and ability to recruit to those trades. We saw it back in June with drivers. Um, we've now thankfully got a full complement, but clearly the whole driving sector is under significant wage price inflation. Um, we've seen that staff and we've seen that in the building trades as well. So the cost of doing any particular job for the authority Clearly, our income levels are not necessarily keeping pace with that that issue. Uh, and then, in in terms of the longer term, the the aging profile of the workforce. So those a lot of those skills, and you know, it's thanks through to the work of Mike and the team and the training and the and delivery of the apprenticeships that we're starting to look at reducing the average age of the, uh, the work profile. But I think the the place average work profile age is. Uh, 49 in, in you know and that's the average in in place of, that's 800 plus staff across housing and all the frontline services it's um it's not healthy really in terms of a, an organization that's planning for a long-term future but that's what's available in the market at this moment in time thank you um any further questions? Um, I welcome, I, I want to make sure I've welcomed the fact that we've got apprentices. I know when my house extension was done in 2003, most of the team were in their late 50s and early 60s. Um, so there is a huge, huge reason to get, to get apprentices in. The other question I'd like to ask quickly, Chair, if I may, is just to pin down the cost in revenue terms to CYC of these voids. Um, of course, we, we focus on, and rightly, on people and how we look after the people that we have as tenants. But I'm very mindful, when, when you talk about, say, 150 homes, uh, 150 voids, we're surely talking over half a million pounds worth of lost revenue there, aren't we? And when we look at the increase in rent arrears of... Uh, about £300,000, it should focus our minds. And I have to say, I'm glad, I, I should say, I'm very happy to see the amount of attention that is being given to the voids in the action plan. But it would be, it would be helpful to just know if we've quantified what that loss is. Yeah, on the previous report, we did report that uh, the forecasting lost rental income is £318,000 due to voice, but that was a, a, a yeah. the first monitor, obviously, we've, and that's a forecast going through, but yeah. reviewing that on an ongoing time, which, as you rightly say, it's a... It's a, yeah. it's a and that yeah. picks up Councillor Pavlich, so, 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 yeah. uh, that picks up Councillor Pavlich's point, I mean, in terms of the funding, it, it, for me, it's a self-fulfilling prophecy. I, I need to put the money in to get the money in. If you say so from, from a strategic perspective, Giving these guys the support and the budget and the resources is, is actually a, a, it's a very easy decision for me to make because it brings the revenue in. And if, if I can, you, yeah. there was just just one point on, uh, from Councillor Pavlovich earlier. Uh, there was an underspend on repairs last year. We carried that repair budget forward. It was added back into this year. So the fact that it wasn't spent last year, it was just brought. It was just put back onto Mike Gilsonen's budget to carry on. It wasn't taken as a sort of yeah. overall saving, it was reinvested back into repairs. Supplementary. Sorry, sorry, Patrick, I, I, I may have misunderstood that. In the budget for this year, there was £200,000 taken out of general repairs. Um, so as part of a £477,000 overall HRA cut. So are you saying that £200,000 cut didn't actually happen? No, I'm not saying that cut didn't happen, but what I am saying is oh. that because there were delays in doing repairs last year, because of the reasons that Mr Gilson has told you, uh, the underspend on the repairs last year was rolled forward into next year's budget, and that was agreed as part of the outturn report. Okay, <clears throat> thank you. Um, Councillor Hollier. Thanks, Chair. Just following on in a way... Um, in terms of the rent arrears, I'm just trying to understand a bit more, I guess, about the trajectory of what's what's happening there. I guess, firstly, how long 
it took to get to build up to 975,000 gives an idea, I guess, of how how much of a difference has happened over the past year. Um, I guess what what you see happening to that 1.25 million at the moment um, in terms of, you know, is it sort of net increasing at the moment? So we're expecting it to, to turn around and start going down again. What measures are the yeah. council? Okay. I think uh, Dan can pick up the specifics because clearly that uh, part of that rise was due to the uh, legislative changes that Michael alluded to in terms of our ability to recover in. But then recovery so far. Yeah. Okay. So um, I'll give you a very potted history. Um, so obviously we've had welfare reform, uh, and uh, the team have uh, done their best to cope with that. So we historically. Um, we've got the arrears the, uh, down to around 600,000 in, in back to around 2016. With the rollout of universal credit, it increased to, to the figure that I've quoted at the beginning of lockdown and then obviously lockdown with the inability to, to take any formal arrears action um, has seen the uh, steady rise up to one and a quarter million. Um, Within, it's difficult, the predictions are difficult um, to make. We've seen some fluctuation within that period. Some months we've actually seen a considerable reduction. Um, there is no direct link with any lockdown period or, or, or easing of, of, of measures. What tends to happen with arrears is the effort you put in now, you see the result of three months later and beyond. Um, that's my experience of having dealt with them over many, many years. Um, and obviously there are significant trigger points like uh, you, the uplift in universal credit, which helped, really helped um, a lot of families. Um, some of the grants that, that uh, were available nationally and locally as well. Uh, and obviously any packages that we see, like the recent announced, uh, recently announced packages of support, we, we absolutely tap into those to help people. We've got our own uh, uh, um, hardship fund as well to help people with specifically COVID-related arrears. So what I'm saying is, with with um, with uh, fuel increases um, happening, with the universal credit uplift, with um, the fluctuating and unpredictable employment situation, um, uh, with house price rises and, and rental rises. It's very, very difficult to predict any sort of linear uh, uh, um, uh, 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 projections on, on, on arrears. What, what I do as a service is, is um, plan, respond, inform, refer, tap into the help that's available to try and mitigate as much of that as, as possible. Um, the team have got really, really used to employing the what I would call softer skills uh, around um, rent collection over the last 18 months. And they've been really successful in, in that. Looking at the figures just, just before I started speaking, we've, we, we've seen a modest decrease of 20,000 pounds over the last month. I wouldn't say, I, I would not put any money on that happening next month um, for the reasons that I've outlined. Um, what we will have is, is, a, is um, um, a continued effort to tap into the help that's available. Um, we will, we've still got a re reduction target of 1%, um, which is very, very modest, but it's something. It, it, it's 1% uh, of um, that, arrears, that arrears total um, over the year. And that's what we're aiming for. That's what the team are working towards. So we will we will do do that. Um, at the beginning of the pandemic, we were seeing twenty to thirty thousand uh, pounds, uh, thirty thousand pounds increases month on month in the first few months of the pandemic. We managed to control that, as I've said, with with work by adopting uh, some of the sort of softer skills. And I think that's absolutely crucial. Um, particularly in the light of, we don't want to create any more voids by evicting people for rent arrears. There are a few people who were just refusing to pay and have, have got away with it. I, I, I won't make any excuses for that. On the whole, people have tried their damnedest to pay the rent and we've tried to help them as much as we can. 
Um, and, um, you know, the last thing we'll be doing is issuing notices of seeking possession and entering people to court because mm. that incurs 300 and odd pounds in court costs um, and we won't be applying for evictions left, right and centre. That doesn't particularly help anybody. And uh, the average void costs well over £10,000 um, in, in real uh, repair, monetary and human costs as well. <clears throat> um, uh, that's not an answer to your question, I know that, but that's um, hopefully that's an explanation of, of, of where we're at with rent arrears. Mm. Um, and um, the fact that it is a very fluid situation and things that come, uh, come online throughout the year um, that impact positively, um, like uh, the announcement of, of various grants and funding that we can tap into as a council, but also negative impacts like the, the uh, universal credit and uplift, downlift, if that makes sense. Adjustment. <laughs> um, I've had a flurry of hands or follow-up questions to that, that response, Denny. So I'll go back to Councillor Hollier, first of all. Thanks. So what, I'm, what I guess I took from that was that in a sort of normal, a normal year, um, post 2016, the rent arrears are essentially increasing the sort of annual rate of about 100,000 overall. And then in the, the 18 months we've just had, it's about 300,000. So a sort of annualized rate of sort of double what we would normally expect. Um, I guess it was just to ask really I know in lots of other areas you know parking charges all sorts of things the government's at least given us a bit of a percentage back of what we would have taken has there been any kind of help in that way with this or is it something people have talked about or is it a kind of hidden cost of covid to the council that perhaps just doesn't get thought about by the government or Yes, yeah, so I suppose in the same way that you referred to the, <clears throat> so that we got a proportion back of lost income, car parking yeah. being one. I'm just <clears throat> guessing there's been no similar scheme. Yeah. For, no. So, the, no. The, the, so if only. Yeah. Uh, yeah. The, yeah, you, you yeah. 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 Uh, yeah the, there hasn't been any it, it, funding coming through. And I think uh, in terms of the previous trend and where we are now and the, the issues that Dan, Dennis has highlighted in terms of the fluctuating circumstances. I think it's something that uh, certainly Tracy and I have talked about on a very regular basis. It's something that we're monitoring because what we can't see is a rapid deterioration. And equally, we've got to reflect, and as Dennis has rightly done so, the human cost of taking action for, for, for debt recovery. Um, so for me, it's one of those things that we've got to have an increased managerial focus on during this period of uncertainty and clearly that's something that the scrutiny might wish to consider to to review on a regular basis and, and clearly we'd be here to to support you in doing that uh, in terms of that recovery re re trajectory thank you <clears throat> councillor public thanks dennis and, and and i think you made a, a really valid point about the pressures that people are going to find themselves um, under do you know off the top of your head um, what percentage of council tenants are, um, are on prepayment meters for their for their fuel? Um, I don't know the answer to that, unfortunately. That's that's uh, potentially something that we can look at. We did do an exercise many years ago when we um, entered into a, an arrangement with British Gas around voids um, and um, looked at who was supplying them and what type of meters were on. And from memory, it was something like about 15, 16% mm. from that. But um, uh, and, again, similar. don't hold me to that. That's, mm. from, that's from memory. Because yeah. um, obviously prepayment meter, people that are on prepayment meters are paying more um, generally, than um, people that are um, that aren't, um, and now with the fuel rises that you've alluded, that you've already made reference to, um, that pressure is is going to increase even more. Um, and you know, and I do have a genuine and 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 and, and Neil, you know, talked about the impact on people, and and we all talk about the impact on people. 
you know, that's that's my big worry, um, that if we've got people that are already in, um, in financial difficulties, um, that balance between heat and food and rent is one of those invidious choices um, that, you know, you hope nobody is ever going to have to make, but unfortunately far too many of the uh, of York's residents are doing. Uh, what help, and, and I know you talk about the hardship fund, but, but are there specific uh, elements of support that the council can offer um, around, um, around the pressures, you know, these additional pressures on, on, um, on fuel costs? Yes, is, is the answer to that. So uh, there is a housing hardship fund um, and um, you will be aware of the package of help that's been announced recently. I'm not gonna repeat that. Um, and we're constantly working with our partners um, in uh, the York Advice Network as well, because uh, we can't, we can't do, do all of the specialist advice. So for example, we're, we're up to date circulated training around water bills. So Yorkshire Water uh, are providing some training later this month and also the Yorkshire Energy Doctor and York Energy Advice. So we'll get staff on, on those to get the most up-to-date position and to be able to refer in as efficiently as possible to get people on onto those. Obviously, what we do is encourage people to pay in uh, to get the best deals, which is, we're all aware, it's quite difficult at the moment. Um, so that's sort of... Um, shot a hole through through that strategy uh, and and obviously where people are in energy debt we refer on to um, uh, the appropriate advice agencies and, and generally if people are in energy debt they're in other debt as well so it's it, it's it's tapping into the excellent work that the uh, citizens advice york do um, to help uh, people stabilize their finances and housing housing debt so obviously rent is is a part of that as well Thank you. Um, I mean, it's one of the yeah. things that I was um, uh, thinking that might be really suitable for the for the community hubs. Um, that you know, if 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 um, we could have debt and advice workers um, based um, based in those, um, you know, that would be potentially the first point of contact. Um, it was great when, uh, well, not great, but when, when people were accessing um, the food parcels for the for, for those that were shielding, um, they were then able to access other advice sessions. And now that we're moving into this more localised hub framework, if you like, um, you know, it would be good if, if housing staff could be based at, at, at some of those to be able to um, to offer advice or to signpost even um, for those people that are coming in that may be um, facing significant hardship. And who wants to pick that yeah, up? Yeah, just to say, I think in terms of the, the, the hub catalog, clearly that's something that uh, uh, Pauline Stutchfield could have a conversation with you in terms of leading on the, the, the services that have been provided from the hubs and uh, whether holistically in, and in terms of cost effectiveness, uh, actually it should be about not more than just the housing service. It should be about that total debt, debt piece. But clearly, Pauline can talk about that because clearly, whenever we talk about uh, things being based in hubs, we're talking about people and people come with their their associated costs. So I'm sure Pauline will be able to pick that one. It, will be the best part. it is something that children, education, communities. We've got a a particular piece of scrutiny work that myself and two other members of that committee are, are doing so would appear so um councillor vassi has one that, and then we'll move on microphone thank you chair with microphone um yes it's just a comment on what uh, Dennis has said and 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 to, to to praise the good work that the council has been doing in the past year um, because when we're looking at energy price volatility and the impact that's having on council uh, uh, receipts um, from tenants, it has to be the case that all that work we're doing and, and intending to do going forwards on retrofitting homes and building energy efficient homes is going to have a long-term insurance benefit 
for the tenants and for the council. Because if, as we've seen in the past month, your energy bill goes, uh, if you've got an energy bill of 15 pounds a month for heating, a 33% increase is five pounds. If your energy bill is 50 pounds a month for heating, that 30% increase is 17 pounds. And that will be making a very clear impact on the ability of tenants to pay. So by retrofitting our properties, by building zero carbon homes, we're helping the council at the same time as we're helping tenants. And I think that's a good thing. And I'm looking forward to it rolling out because it's part of changing the dynamics for us all. Yeah, preempting the next agenda item, <laughs> Councillor yeah. Vassi, which is fine. Um, if we draw that to a close, as well, just one, one thing I'd, I'd kind of highlight is the importance of the communications work um, that, that you mentioned. I know in, in you know, when you're in the midst of a an emergency situation, as we have been, sometimes your focus is on just getting as much work done as possible. Um, I think you're right to focus on <clears throat> communicating with, um, with, 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 with with residents and 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 I suppose sort of empowering and giving giving to officers in the field the information that they need because they often get the, the the questions and the and, and the complaints and and uh, as as councillors do and then we sort of make our problems your problems and 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 so it goes on you know do um, use councillors as a, a sounding board when when you want to in terms of this is how we're going to approach. Um, you know this this kind of expectation management um, <clears throat> work, and this is how we're going to communicate what we're doing and what our action plan is. Um, you know, it's it's in all of our interests to make sure that that lands with with tenants and that there's that that kind of shared understanding. Uh, so yeah, uh, and we will try and um, whilst holding holding officers to account, we'll try and help as well because you know we don't want to unnecessarily further add burdens to your already full plates. Okay. <laughs> yeah, it's looking at no one in particular. Um, it's, it's five past seven. Do members want a quick five minute comfort break and then we'll reconvene at 10 past and crack on with the rest of the agenda. Okay to pause us, Richard. Thank you.
Okay, welcome back everybody. Um, so we move on a pace. Our next agenda item is an update on the housing energy efficiency strategy. Um, I thought we can do the decent at homes before or after, Michael. What do you think makes sense? I'm guessing decent at homes. Yeah. Okay. No, that that's fine. So we published as um, a late paper under urgent business was a, an update on the decent home standard, but I've agreed that we will take this now, um, which fits better than leaving it till the end, given that we've just been talking about. Um, <clears throat> about housing services. Um, so the, the uh, sort of the slide pack has been sort of published. And Michael, are you okay to speak to that? I am, yeah. So I um, didn't introduce myself last time. Michael Jones, Head of Housing Delivery and Asset Management. Um, so we've had a few queries over the last few months about decent homes, what decent home is and what it isn't. Um, it's one of our KPIs on the KPI machine, so information is, is available to everybody who wants to see it. Um, so I'm just going to talk a little bit about what a decent home is, what the measurements we use to determine whether a home is decent or not. Talk about where we're up to at the moment in terms of our performance against those measurements and what our plans are for investment and improvements moving forward to increase the number of decent homes um, within the council housing stock. So there's central government guidance on decent homes. And in simple terms, a decent home is one which is warm, weatherproof, and has reasonably modern facilities. The guidance uh, came into force in 2004. It was then amended in 2006 to take greater account of health and safety considerations. Um, one of the big things that the um, document talks about is that you should use decent homes as a guide to long-term investment decisions. So a non-decent home doesn't necessarily need urgent investment. It's a standard that you should use to understand your stock generally and then to make strategic decisions on that basis. So there are four primary considerations as to whether a home is decent or not. Um, all require a degree of interpretation, so um, it's not an exact science, although there are some scientific elements to the measurements. So the first measurement is whether a home meets minimum standards in terms of health and safety. I've listed on the presentation a number of category one hazards, so if a council house um, has any of these hazards, it would, it would be a non-decent home, so it includes things like Structural fails, um, electrical issues, um, falls, pollutants, um, but the full list is, is in your pack. Um, luckily, we don't have many, many within this category. Uh, the second criteria is whether a home is in a reasonable state of repair. Um, so if one of the key building components or um, two or more of other building components are old and require repair or major works, they would fail this category. So in terms of the key components, you're looking at external walls, roofs, windows, doors, chimneys, central heating, gas fires, plumbing, electrics, all the stuff that you'd expect to be a key component of a, of a healthy home. Third category is whether the facilities are reasonably modern. So um, that includes such things as a kitchen. So if a kitchen's more than 20 years old, um, if the layout or the size isn't appropriate, if the bathroom's more than 30 years old, again, it, it, can, it can fail this. This is one of the ones where there's a degree of interpretation. So you can visit a property and if the kitchen is still in good condition, despite being more than 20 years old, it can be considered a decent home. And the final category is, um, does the home provide a reasonable level of thermal comfort? Um, so this is around effective insulation and the heating system. This guidance is about 14 years old. Things have moved on a lot um, since then. Um, so I'll talk a little bit later on about a review of the policy, but there's currently a, an, a, an account taken for whether a home is warm and comfortable for the residents. Um, so as I said, the Decent Homes guidance provides advice on how to use it. So it says that the standard should trigger the planning of actions 
it is not necessarily a standard that should always trigger immediate work. So it's about understanding your stock. And then once you understand your stock, planning your investment around what you know. Um, and the other thing that the government clear to state is it's not about putting all of your resources into non-decent homes. It's thinking about homes that you've got in your stock that may um, be at risk from um, being a non-decent home in the future. So it's about balancing investment in non-decent homes with decent homes so that you have the best quality of stock um, available for your residents. So in terms of how in York we've measured decent homes, so pre-2016, so before Mike came to work for the authority, uh, we took an approach where a home was considered decent unless there was data which otherwise proved that it wasn't. So that required a, a number of assumptions being made. Um, and as, I, as you will see on the next slide, those assumptions resulted in incredibly low numbers of non-decent homes being reported pre-2016. Um, in recent years, we've had a much more robust and cautious approach. So a lack of information has been treated as a potential fail. Um, the other key consideration that um, I want to outline is we now know a lot more about our council housing stock than we did in 2016. So um, under Mike's leadership, we've done a stock condition survey, which has identified a number of issues about our housing stock, which wasn't currently reported. Um, and we've used this information to plan our long-term investment plans. So th there's a, a graph in the presentation, which shows virtually 0% non-decent homes between 2011 and 2015-16. So when the standard came in, there was a target set by central government that all authorities and stockholding um, organisations should aim for zero decent homes by 2010. So as you can see, that was, that was broadly achieved in York. The, the key um, information here is, as I outlined pre-2016, how we calculated decent homes. In 2017, um, we realized that we didn't have um, compliant electric tests. So that's an electric test carried out within the, the last 10 years, within 546 homes. And then in 2019, Michael Mike led a, an extensive stock condition survey, uh, which showed some is issues around the aging condition of kitchens, some roofs um, and some electrical wire issues. And then the final positive um, trend on the, on the decent homes graph is showing that there's an improve, been improvement from 11% non-decent homes to 8.8% um, in the last year or so. So knowledge is power. So since we've um, undertaken that data gathering exercise, um, Mike has led the establishment of a uh, much more rigorous electrical test check. So every council house now gets electrical check every five years, which means that 20% of our homes get tested every year. This is an investment of about two and a half million pounds over the next five years. And that covers both the electrical check and any remediation work that's needed um, when we find any issues. We've also reprofiled our tenants' choice work. So that's the work where people get new kitchens, new bathrooms within their council house. And we've brought forward 645 um, additional um, tenants' choice works in the next five years, which is bringing forward about a five million pound investment program. Uh, Mike's already, already also worked to increase the number of contractors that we work with. So we've gone from one contractor doing all the tenants' choice work, we now have four contractors. So we've got a greater capacity, a greater scope and more choice um, in, in delivering that investment um, promise. Um, we've also re re reprofiled our roofing programme to take account of both age and condition. So previously we just looked at age 
Uh, we now know more about our stock, so we, we now understand the condition. So we're, we're reprofiling so that we're re-roofing based on condition and not just because a property has, a, has an old roof, which may be in, in perfectly reasonable working order. Um, and as we've talked about a little bit today, we've established our retrofit programme. So one of the tests is, is your home warm and comfortable? And we hope over the next few years to, to upgrade our worst performing um, energy inefficient council homes to make them more comfortable, warm, and reduce the energy bills of our residents. So the, the, the final bit that I want to say is um, in terms of future considerations. So the government are undertaking a review of the decent home standard at the moment. First part is to understand whether there's a case to review the criteria. Um, I'm guessing the answer is going to be yes, because they've already talked about a second stage, which is going to be how decency is going to be defined moving forward. Um, final consideration is the housing white paper, which I think was published in 2019 now, um, which also talks about a number of plan changes and um, a requirement to be more open and transparent um, about health and safety requirements in all council homes. That was it for me. Any questions? Thank you very much, um, Michael. Um, quick question. <laughs> Just from looking at looking at the graph and thinking about what we've been talking about previously about backlogs of repairs, obviously it's <clears throat> yeah, the, there's the start of a of, of a uh, sort of positive trajectory. Do you, given what we discussed earlier in terms of other issues that you're having to contend with, do you think that those issues will impact on the continued improvement in the in the traje trajectory of non-decent to decent classification yeah, yeah um sure um yeah of course there's there is potential not just in terms of our in-house teams but in, in terms of contractor capacity and stuff like that so yeah it, it could impact it if if our contractors can't get joiners they can't get you know their, their, their labor of course however the, the biggest the biggest thing um uh, around decent homes is actually it's a tool with which we can identify and as Michael said, it, it gives us that direction. And, and, and the thing around it is that um, we, we do need to be as transparent and brave about saying we've identified these issues. This is what we need to do to direct them. And what that means is in terms of it doesn't necessarily come with a, a massive amount of additional cost. Actually, it can be the point of making better use of your money because you're identifying the, the homes that are going to cost you more in reactive repairs. If you, see, if you see what I'm saying. So you'll drive, you, you'll, you'll be able to use more um, cost-efficient plan maintenance uh, methods of delivering repairs rather than cost, more costly reactive kind of ad hoc type of repairs. So, so yes, there could be an impact, but I think the, 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 but moreover, we stand in better stead because we've looked at the data, we've given it a cold hard stare, and said, right, this is what we need to this is what we need to do in order to put things right. It means we will need to reprofile some of the programs. It means, means we may we'll have to change some of the programs around. In the past, there's been, and I can I can kind of understand it um, um, around that people tend to say we work on a cycle. And people understand kind of a 30-year cycle, something like that, but that doesn't get to where you're you the, the core of the issue. And so I think this, yeah, I'd say there could be some issues, but the fact that we've looked at it. And we understand it sets us in much better stead. Thank you. Councillor Pavlovic. No, I think that's a very sensible, um, proactive um, maintenance uh, rather than reactive maintenance. What, what I did want to ask you, though, is, is the category one hazards, um, yeah. those that are sort of injurious to health. Um, and yeah. I'm thinking particularly of damp and mould. Yeah. Um, standing water um, and there was a reference in the earlier report to mm. issues like the standing water in Bell Farm yeah. uh, not being done you know and whilst uh, certainly um, that um, proactive um, maintenance would it not make more sense to deal first with those that are actually significant issues for tenants' health, 
such as asbestos, uh, such as asbestos or damp and mold. Yeah. And the category one hazards that have been identified in this report, or is that what is done? No, that, that is what I mean. What, so one of the things, just to, just to give you some assurance around the category one, when we when we carried out the the stock condition survey, we carry out the first HHSRS survey of, of council stock. You know, that we that we were the first time, and. Um, and, and what we had a clear process, any category one hazards that were found, we immediately sent people to resolve them. Right. Um, I would say around the, the damper mold thing, around the, cat the category hazards, there is about the extent of that. Mm. So clearly if it's a couple of windows and it's a bit, then it's not gonna hit the kind of things. But if you've got a home that's completely covered in damp mm. and it's continually cold, and stuff like that, then it will start to hit the things. But anyway, the survey, we, um, we um, followed that survey through and any of the, I think we found in total through that survey, something like 27 properties where they had category one hazards and we sent people and immediately dealt with them. Because um, we knew that that would be an immediate fail, but also you've got risk of, of, of health problems and things mm. like that. Good, excellent. Thank you. <clears throat> any further questions? Um, thank you, Michael, and thank you, uh, Mike. I think the reflecting on what we heard in the last <clears throat> agenda item and, and this one, I think it, th th there are issues that we would want to come back to as a as a committee just to get an update on. You know, <clears throat> who knows what will happen in the next six months, uh, but potentially the April public meeting in next year will will sort of pencil in a. Uh, maybe an update then, uh, but we can discuss between now and then what that might cover. Um, <clears throat> potentially, because I think that there's a connection um, between both. Obviously, the uh, you know <clears throat> if you know if we're told that well, if you wait a month, more data will be available that will give you a better picture. Then we can have that we can have that conversation. But I think if um, I think that now we've we've had you know we certainly I have a better understanding of the decent home standard and what the information is is telling us. I think it it, it could be a um, it could be an update with an update on on where we are in terms of that trajectory and whether some of the impacts we discussed have had um, a detrimental effect. So could I ask officers then if if this was to come if the um, housing. Um, not the housing standards, the, the last report that we had, um, I don't know what its title was, um, but would, would April next year, um, would you expect to have seen a significant improvement in the backlog of cases, the void numbers? Um, is, it, is, is, is that a suitable time, do you think, for, um, for us to be able to evidence from yourselves? that um, we're actually making some inroads. Michael? Um, I can't promise anything in that regard, but I think what we can say is that um, over the next few weeks, we're going to enact the action plan that we've described to you today. We expect that there'll be certainly some positive impacts that will come out of that. Um, other external factors may happen that, that have an impact beyond our... Um, our current analysis, but I think that April next year will be a good opportunity to talk about the action plan, the positive impact that we've seen from that, and maybe some of the things that perhaps need reviewing and, and, a, and a further thought about what the actions could be to resolve them. Yeah, I mean, yeah, yeah. So obviously, you know, some some aspects of the plan might deliver benefits, others maybe not as anticipated. But that's the same with any. Um, piece of work but I think that yeah if we if we pencil that in and, and aim to have a a bit of an update and a stock take in in April super thank you very much um right and this time we will move on to housing energy efficiency strategy um and thank you Andrew Bebbington for joining us um this is <clears throat> an issue we've discussed at this committee in the past and it's really good to see the work that that has been done and is being done to really sort of flesh out the the ambition that we've discussed previously, so the the ask for for scrutiny is to consider the content of the briefing document that that Andrew's provided, and the identified action plans, uh, and to provide thoughts on whether they capture the key needs for the improvement of residential energy efficiency. 
So who would like to introduce this paper? Um, I'm going to very, very briefly set it up and then right. I'm going to hand over to um, Andrew, who's done all the work on it. So um, we obviously saw today the government announced their roadmap towards zero carbon for 2050. So it feels very timely to be talking about this today. Um, York obviously has a much more ambitious roadmap of, of zero carbon by, by 2030. Um, and we hope that this emerging housing energy efficiency strategy can be a key part of that. Um, the residential sector in York um, has a greater contribution to the city's carbon emissions than the national figures that were promoted today. So it's of, of particular importance to the city that we have a, a good long term robust strategy for reducing carbon emissions within our housing sector. Um, but what I wanted to outline is that this is, is part of a suite of strategies that are coming forward by the council. Um, and we very much want this to be connected to those other strategies that are coming forward. So I'm referring to the climate strain, change strategy um, and the economy and skills strategy, which I believe are coming forward to um, executive early next year. And we hope to bring this document along to be part of that suite of documents so that they can be all considered together because there's significant overlap between, between each of those strategies. Um, and the work streams within them in order to create a, a city citywide change. Um, so more specifically, this report is building on an exec approval from December 2020, which was the kind of launch of the council's retrofit programme. Um, there's been a number of decisions come into Council Craghill's decision sessions about successful grant applications to deliver retrofit on the ground. Um, but this is the first airing of um, a kind of longer term strategy um, because the, the approach of chasing central government money to deliver short term um, improvements whilst very welcome to get us going isn't a effective long term strategy to create a significantly reduced um, level of carbon emissions from our um, housing stock in the city. So I'll hand over to Andrew, who's going to talk you through the work that he's been doing um, over the last few months. Thanks very much. Um, so I'm Andrew Bevington, Housing Policy Officer. And um, yeah, it's certainly, you know, it's, it's, it's a quite an exciting day to be um, talking about this with the government having set out quite, quite a bit more detail than we had before um, about what central government support there's going to be for... Um, for decarbonizing the you know the country's housing housing stock um now why why do we you know why do we need to do this um you know why why, why is this a priority improving energy efficiency in in people's homes um it's it's more than 30 well you know, more than 30 percent of the local um carbon emissions in york are estimated to, to come from um you know domestic sources um heat and sort of electricity use in the home and um, that is, and, and, and bringing that, that level down is going to make a huge contribution to, um, de, you know, decarbonizing the, the city and ultimately the, the, the country as a, as a whole. And I think it's, it's probably fair to say we can't really get to net zero without tackling the, um, um, the carbon emissions from, from people's homes at the end of the day. Um, so what, what's, what are the key parts of our um, strategy? Um, well, it's it's got to be across all ten years. There's something like eighty six thousand homes in in York, and um, obviously the majority of those aren't in the in you know aren't in the council's ownership. They're private landlords and especially owner occupiers. But of course, we've got the most control over the properties that, that we do own. So we need we need a strategy that you know that covers covers all all ten years. Um, the skills and the supply chain are absolutely crucial to, to scaling up the, the work um, that's you know that, that's needed. Of course, you know um, a huge portion of those eighty six thousand homes would need some improvement at the end of the day to um, to reduce the carbon emissions and um, you know save energy and save residents fuel bills. Um, and that that is going to take a complete step change in the you know in the, in, in sort of. Um, construction and trades um, and ultimately manufacturing sectors as well. Um, there's the, the funding is is crucial. It's going to cost a lot of money to do, do all this work that's needed. Um, not all of that money is going to come from the government, although you know they have set out today that 
the, the, they are increasing the you know the sort of um, the, the, the central funds that are are, are going to be um, available, um, and certainly you know the, the not all of it's going to come from the council either. There's actually you know huge opportunities to sort of unlock the um, some of the energy savings that um, residents who can afford to pay would make um, through you know improvements in the in financial products and the finance sector that, that are going to be available. Um, then another crucial thing is, um, uh, you know, a bit of a theme of the evening is, is, is good data and understanding the local stock, you know, um, setting, setting really evidence-based priorities so that we understand um, what the pathway is from, from here to scaling up all this energy efficiency improvement work. And, um, and uh, yeah, of course, fit, fitting that into the wider um, ambition that the council's got to... Um, to tackle the climate crisis and um, and move towards net zero, so just just stepping back um, a minute, the um, you know we're, we're, well the sort of you know this is sort of slightly new area and there's a lot of um, jargon. So I suppose how, housing energy efficiency is something you often achieve through um, retrofit works, which are all about um, insulating the properties better to reduce the amount of heat loss through materials. Improving air tightness as well to sort of reduce drafts and you know prevent heat loss that way, and then um, ventilation is really important as well because um, if if you sort of improve air tightness without addressing ventilation, then that can that can cause um, knock on effects as well, um, and so that so that's how you improve the um, you know the sort of the thermal performance of the building itself, but then the the and then what that allows is that you can. Um, typically replace the gas boiler with, with something um, such as a heat pump um, instead, which works much better in a, in a more energy efficient um, property. And of course, you know, heat, heat pumps again being in the news today, um, they, they do rely on a certain degree of energy efficiency in the home, but um, because they extract heat from, uh, you know, for example, an air source heat pump extracts heat from the air outside, they're, they're much more efficient in the, um, and, and emit much less carbon. Than, um, than gas boilers, and so that so that's the goal. But of course, um, it's actually you know making inroads on achieving that with the huge diversity that, that you get in the in the housing stock is is, is you know sort of very com complex um, task. Um, and um, yeah, um, so so yeah, so the sort of the you know the property types, the age of the property, the build build type, whether it's solid wall or cavity wall. Um, is 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 one critical factor that needs to be taken into account, and then of course the other, the other is the the tenure. So we know that the the sort of vast majority of um, properties rated EPCD and below, which is sort of rough measure of um, you know room for sort of significant improvement. Um, the vast majority of those are in the owner occupied sector, where to you know to an extent we've we've got the least control. So. Um, the um, so, so the sort of key aspect of um, of you know that cross tenure approach includes um, enga engaging with residents and sort of human factors. You know, people have got to be motivated to understand the benefits that they, that they can get in, in in taking this action. Sometimes, you know, some of the works that are needed might be quite disruptive, um, and um, you know the, the the sort of benefits in terms of reducing bills, people might not always be aware of that. So engaging people is um, is, is a really imp important part of it, and that also comes back to the you know the, the sort of supply chain and the long term skills base. So if people if um, if people don't have a you know a sort of trusted supplier who um, who is who, you know the, the, the believe they're going to do the work in a you know in, in their own homes in a sort of adequate way and that they understand what what what's going to be done. Um, pe people need that sort of assurance, really, about the supplier market, um, and you know, in a sort of, it's you know, it's it's, it's not it's not a fully mature uh, marketplace. It's probably fair to say at the moment, and there's a lot of development there um, that the council is is already taking taking a lead on through, for example, some of the training that that um, you mentioned earlier, Mike, um, with getting council council staff skilled up on um, on these future future technologies. Um, in terms of the council's own stock, um, the, we know that from from EPC data that um, there's there's several archetypes that are more likely to be an EPC rated um, D or below. 
which tend to be pre pre World War II houses and um, bungalows. So that's enabled us to to map the stock data that we've got and um, sort of design a more 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 targeted more targeted approach. Um, now um, the council has also sort of been been very busy, um, you know, with ver various sort of delivery teams run, running um, running programs um, ourselves as well as you know trying to sort of plan plan for the future. The um, some the, the various government programs. Um, which um, which don't always you know which tend to be on a sort of quite a quick bid bid deadline turnaround. So the response to that is inevitably a little bit reactive. Um, but it's all part of the sort of building you know building the the supply chain, building the skills base, um, getting residents you know more sort of aware of of the opportunities here. And um, so the council's been successful in bidding for uh, two rounds of the local authority delivery program. And um, has bids uh, for for the local another, another round of that program plus the social housing decarbonisation fund, and um, both of those are being scaled up by the government as well um, as a, as announced today. So that you know that's um, something where we've had an experience that that will you know we should should be um, build building on that for the future. And um, there's also the the energy company obligation. Um, program that's funded through energy companies that the council um, is sort of uh, participates in, and there's an announcement expected soon on what's happening with that program from from next next April, and that that's going to be you know again that program is going to work across all ten years to offer various retrofit measures to people's homes, and um, it's going to be an important part of the the pathway to um, to get into you know such a large number of properties. Um, in, um, a better, you know, better state of energy efficiency, and um, the council's own stock. There's there's sort of two two aspects to the, um, how we're working on the on the council's council's own stock, and there's the retrofit phases one and two, which have been um, agreed at um, executive, and um, there's sort of plan, planning work underway to scope out the uh, you know the sort of high high quality. Um, uh, property suitable approaches that um, that will take that, and then the other aspect is it is is building into the sort of everyday um, work of the building services team and the and the, and the capital investments, um, build, building in um, the sort of the investment for the future and the and, the, and, the, and a retrofit um, ready approach in, into that work. So one example is. Um, Considering the you know investments in future uh, heating systems um, would normally but you know business as usual is gas boilers, but um, I don't trying to identify opportunities where that could be changed to to heat pumps. But actually, you know, it um, works works to roofs, windows, even insulation, new kitchen and bathrooms. There's, you know, there's, um, sort of might be opportunities in all those processes to improve improve the, pro the properties. Um, and as, as sort of mentioned before, it's uh, there's never been a better time to, to do that really in terms of um, residents in the in in the city. Um, we know that, of course, for many of our own tenants, they they might be facing you know uh, fuel poverty and um, you know have have sort of real challenges on um, on on pay, paying the bills and there could be knock on effects to other areas of their life. So um, taking action, you know, and the sooner you sort of take action there. The sooner those bills can be, the sooner those savings on bills can be can be realised. And since we know that they're you know they're only likely to increase the next time the caps um, increased in April, and you know the sort of future outlook is um, you know isn't, isn't isn't too promising really as far as energy costs go. The return on um, making those improvements is, is is going to be really valuable. And the most of the government funding programmes tend to be targeted at people who are who are considered in fuel poverty, which is people with um, Lower income in a in a property rated EBC D or below, and that's you know that's that's a key priority for the council certainly in delivering those programmes. However, um, we know that because um, incomes in York are typically above the, the you know many many people in York are, um, have an income that's above the, the sort of fuel poverty threshold, um, and many many people that have a sort of you know more medium or higher income in York. Do live in properties um, that are likely to be EPC D and below, and have significant room for you know for improvement in energy efficiency. Um, 
that is that is something where you know we need we need a completely different approach to delivering government programs where it's it's more about build, you know building the market engaging engaging with residents looking at those opportunities and at the end of the day the savings on energy costs are going to be really valuable for you know for people of all incomes and you know potentially um, could benefit benefit the local economy as well because it's money that they're not spending on you know um, purchasing gas at the end of the day and, and paying to big national energy companies but they've got that to spend in, in the local economy um so yeah all, all those themes and the sort of um you know cro cross a lot of cross-cutting themes there and a lot of sort of complexities to try and try and unpick but um and just just to one one final note is that we are proposing to embed um the PAS 2035 retrofit standard into the into the work that, that we do which is all about making sure that um what's is, is, it sort of embeds what's called a no regrets approach where every step of the pathway from the current state of a home to um sort of ideal ideally you know decarbonized future is um is is you know sort of builds in a sequence and um is done to the, the highest quality so it doesn't you know doesn't cause those knocking effects that that some some previous programs have, have seen where you know insulation can but you know badly badly done insulation can cause damp damp problems or in, and you know it's, it's not it's not having to be un, unpicked at a later later stage so that's that's something we'd certainly you know be grateful for for, for views yeah. um thank you well. andrew thank you um thank you for that and, and thanks for the report and it's, it's really good to see a a draft strategy that has lots of data in and 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 you know real things that make it make it far <clears throat> as a relative layperson far more easy to kind of engage with where you can see maps and you can say oh, i know where that is and, and you, you can really um sort of piece together what the what the issue is and what the sort of proposed solutions are and i suppose that's really for members comments as to the extent to which we think the strategy addresses the I suppose the challenge is and takes advantage of the opportunities. Uh, Councillor Vassi, I'm not surprised to see you. Think, so. <laughs> Thank you, Chair. I very much welcome the report. And there are a number of graphs, as you said, that are incredibly helpful. Um, and I have a number of points and questions, if I may. Go for it. Um, the first thing is that this there is a context to all of this we're currently developing our devolution strategy and looking at how we're going to move forwards uh, with housing across the region and the thing that i found that was missing in the devolution strategy and i hope it'll be included in future iterations i think is relevant here and that is the, the, the devolution strategy says we're ambitious and realistic in, in our vision. But the thing that's missing from it is actually any form of expression of how much retrofitting the homes across the region would cost. And we have a third of a million homes in the region. And if we work just on a, a you know, figure out of thin air that each home costs £30,000 to retrofit, that's immediately 10 billion pounds. And I very much want us to, to face that because when we talk about, oh, we'll have 100 million pounds to retrofit some homes, we need to be clear with ourselves, with residents, with government, with everyone about the scale of the challenge we really feel, uh, that, that, that we, we face. And your report details the kind of things that we can do and it, it's fantastic i just want us to be clear about that and if we look at it just in terms of york ninety thousand homes is about 2.7 billion pounds to retrofit if they all cost thirty thousand pounds to retrofit um i think we need to see something of that in this strategy so that we can show we're really facing the problem or the challenge i should say rather than the problem once we do that, I think then we can start to look at the mechanisms that are going to have to be needed to tackle that challenge. And in particular, I'm, I'm fortunate to represent the city on the North Yorkshire Pension Fund. And the North Yorkshire Pension Fund is sitting on about £5 billion that it has for its members to ensure that they have their pensions paid. 
In the past six months, a decision has been made to move 10% of that fund towards infrastructure. And for me, there's a critical opportunity if we find a way of engaging with all of this. If we can find a way of creating a program for retrofitting homes that works for institutional investors, that enables them to earn a return, if we can develop those contracts that say, we will retrofit 10,000 homes, and here is the mechanism that will allow the institutional investor to earn the money back from, put, from paying for that retrofitting over 10 years, over 15 years. If we can create those kind of structures, then I think some of the stuff we have in here can actually be delivered. And, and the last point I'd make in relation to that is, the, is page 55, where you detail um, the housing stock. And I think I'm right in saying, uh, Andrew, this is a, a, national, a set of national figures of the kinds of generic housing stock we have. And uh, you, you look at... Uh, pre-1945 semi-detached houses, for example. We know we've got thousands of those in our city. Do we actually know exactly how many have we ordered at our city? And are we ready to produce with the forthcoming North Yorkshire Unitary Authority, a plan that could be put to government to say, we will undertake to retrofit a thousand pre-war semi-detached homes with the ambition of reducing the cost of retrofitting each of those by say 30 or 40 percent over the doing of it because by doing it we'd have skills we'd learn about the materials and then we'd be able to project doing that across the region in a way that institutional investors might buy into and we might persuade government to see us as the kind of place where they can achieve the ambitions that they're declaring today. So, I mean, that's a, a whole lot of uh, blah, you might say, but I'd really, I'd really welcome, first of all, to know, do we have those figures for York? Um, and do officers see the opportunity uh, for, finding ways of attracting institutional investors to tackle the real scale of the problem that we face. <clears throat> Andrew? Thank you, yeah. Uh, well, great great questions there. Uh, plenty to, to go on. So yeah, starting off with the, the data sets. Um, yeah, I mean, I completely agree. That is, you know, that, that's key to understanding what, what we need to do. Um, certainly, we are just in the process of commissioning um, an updated sort of set of, of software and uh, data mapping. So, um, yeah, that that will enable more, you know, more of this kind of analysis to be to be done really quickly. Uh, that, well, that's the idea anyway, and, and, and it's all integrated. It's all supposed to be integrated into to mapping as well. So that so that's well underway, and I completely agree about you know the importance of knowing knowing that that really well. Um, and then, yeah, uh, so. Yeah, the sort of interlinked questions of how much would it cost in total, and um, then yeah, how, you know what what means could we use to to, to pay for it? Um, the yeah, the, I think that, that that that's a really good good idea for the, the strategy. We'll look at you know sort of giving out some total total costed scenarios, and the yeah, I think the I suppose actually I haven't seen that mentioned the institutional investor idea, but it's, yeah, it sounds like you know sort of some really important one to potentially leverage. Um, there is some movement in the financial sector just recently. Nationwide Building Society have been doing some work around, you know, sort of leading some publicity on, you know, green finance. And I think, so hopefully that is building up some momentum. And I agree that that's exactly what it needs, because I suppose you can sort of see it that, you know, for all the, the billions of pounds it's going to cost, there's a, there's, a, there's a huge revenue stream potentially available to pay for it with savings on energy costs. It's just that I suppose that it's, you know, it's uh, translating the, the revenue stream into, into the upfront capitalized investment is, 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 you know, more complicated than a lot of areas because it's a bit, you know, every house is different. So the actual performance and, and savings and, and every household is different as well. So the actual savings is a little bit uncertain. 
and then the cost of the work is is of course a bit uncertain as well again because you know it's not because it's going out there on on every individual property and there's a lot, so yes yeah, so i think the uncertainties maybe have, have held held that back slightly but there's more work going on to try and model that out and um i think there's incre you know increasing attention to to how that could work and start go, going back to sort of paz 2035 having having an industry standard that's really good quality improves i suppose that you know um the, the certainty people can act on which i think you know is, is a lot of what investors want at the end of the day isn't it they want to they want to get a good idea of the return and that's exactly what um house you know households want as well so i think i think yeah that, that that's that's exactly the the approach that's needed for for, for people that um don't you know aren't are going to qualify under any government schemes um it's a matter of building on that momentum developing both the financial products and the supply chain that can actually you know do, do the work to deliver on it and um you know, um, start going from a sort of almost not a standing start exactly, but not that much further along, I suppose, to now trying to rapidly upscale to, you know, meet, meet the ambition that we know um, that, that, you know, that, 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 we're, that we're leading on in the council. Thank you, Andrew. Uh, Michael? Um, yeah, just quite quickly. Um, so we, we are speaking to a number of organisations to understand that kind of institutional investment um, angle. Um, We've been speaking to a company called Energy Sprung, who you may know of, who have done a lot of work with um, Nottingham City Council. Um, and their model um, at the moment is uh, councils put in a good chunk of money um, and they get that investment back over a 30 year period by um, adding a comfort charge on top of the residents' rent. So the comfort charge guarantees that um, the outgoing of the resident will be less than their existing rent plus utility cost. So rent plus comfort charge will be less. So the resident gets financial saving um, and the council um, gets its money back over a 30 year period. But I know that they're doing a lot of work over the next few years trying to bring that cost down. So that then becomes attractive to institutional investors because even asking councils to borrow the amount of money that are needed to pay it back over 30 years is going to be prohibitive so um yeah absolutely agree that that that's a really important angle taking this forward thank you Chair, can back just on that? Say it, it would be i certainly would find it hugely interesting to see more about that scheme how that's being assembled and i say that again because of, because i'm sitting on the the pension fund i can tell you around the pension fund table uh they're looking at green infrastructure and the question they're asking is, will this give us a 7% return? And if the answer is yes, then it's, well, how rigorously is this sort of, uh, uh, thought through contractually? How much confidence can I have? Uh, and, and if the answer to all those questions is yes, then I think we, we begin to reach the point where we can persuade institutional investors to buy in. And you express it in terms of a comfort charge. Uh, in the discussions I've had with uh, the pension pool and with members of the pension fund committee, the kind of language that is used is, well, if you go from a situation where, say, a house is spending £1,000 a year on heating, that may be a conservative estimate, but let's say £1,000 a year on heating. If you retrofit the home and you can bring the cost of heating that home to 100 or 150 pounds a year, there is an eight or 850 pound difference there. How do we make sure that some of that benefit goes to the homeowner and some of that benefit goes to the uh, institutional investor? And my hunch is that if we can create those instruments in ways that actually work, then we can start to unlock uh, some of the the funding that we know is is way beyond the seed funding we're talking about mm. and and i'll leave with one little other point and then shut up on this chair uh, it, and it it is it's just and it was touched on by by officers and it's touched on in this report none of this actually delivers a zero carbon future unless all the people who are beneficiaries of retrofitted homes 
in private homes, in council homes, in all buildings across the city, buy into this and change their way of life. If, if all we do is think that we can retrofit carbon away from our city, then we're in cuckoo land. Because if you save a thousand quid on your heating bill and spend it on a trip to Bali, you've not actually cut carbon <laughs> at all. So it's just to make that point, but the context is really critical to this. And I hope that we, the whole city buys into it and, and, and that we help make real change happen. Thank you. <clears throat> Councillor Pavlovic. Thank you, Chair. Um, yeah, and this, this report, I read like some sort of university piece. Uh, so it's a cracking, uh, genuinely cracking piece of, um, of work. Um, and I suspect, and, and, and Councillor Fenton mentioned it right at the um, outset, it's, it's good for the layperson um, um, to be able to understand this. And yeah, I'm very much in that layperson camp. Um, and, and to some extent, I'm the perfect audience um, for you to be selling this to, essentially. And, and, and I think, um, think Councillor Vassi's um, made reference to it. Um, and this is where I think, and, and, and you were looking at, at how, do the, how can the council um, um, take this opportunity and, and, and develop it, um, is notwithstanding everything we've talked about and the pressures on the maintenance teams and all the rest of it, but you are developing a skill set, if you like, uh, amongst the technical teams um, that I don't think is, is, is widely out there um, within the private sector. So already you're coming at this from a position of um, strength. And I'll give you an example. I'll give you a personal example. I have no idea what the EPC of my house is. Um, I know I've got some double glazing, I've got some single glazing, but I genuinely want to do something about uh, reducing my carbon footprint, if you like, um, and have a more energy efficient house and um, increasingly save, save money as well. Now, I looked up um, when we started first talking about EPCs, um, how do I get an EPC um, rating for my house? Who, who, who will come and assess it? And so I looked on the internet and there, there are various companies, but I have no idea. You know, it, it, it could be the man that just says, I'm an EPC assessor. If, if we had those um, skills, you know, I would buy that service in from the council because I wouldn't think that you had an ax to grind um, and were trying to sell me something. Um, and, and I think that, that, that those opportunities you know, it, it's, it's like the old days when we used to have um, pest controllers. Um, you know, if you, had a, if you had a bee infestation or a wasp infestation or a rat infestation, you'd call the council, whether you were a private tenant or, 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 or not. Um, and I think that this might be one of those opportunities where you can meet Councillor Avassi's aspirations of saying, um, you know, we can do this work for you even, um, and it will cost you this, and it will be paid back over this amount of uh, over this amount of time, whether you're a council tenant or whether you're a private um, owner occupier or a landlord. But I did also just have another question. Um, sorry, that was a bit more of a speech than a question, but it was just an observation as much as anything else. Um, if you're doing these 60 council homes, um, how are you going to ensure that um, they don't immediately then become right to buy properties um, and we don't um, recoup any of those um, upfront costs that we're paying? Uh, I think that's one of the nub of the problems that we can't. So, um, any significant investment like this, the the homeowner may benefit, the, ho the householder may benefit. They may they may then exert their right to buy. We don't have any control over that. Mm. Mm. So that, that 
Just go going back to <clears throat> Sorry, Chair. Um, yeah. Could you not just add some some sort of contractual um, that you will at least at least recoup your costs from the sale price? Yeah. So the example I gave earlier of um, Energy Sprung, um, they have been working with their legal team so that the mechanism on the occupant is that they have to keep paying the comfort charge even if they exert their right to buy and become a homeowner rather than a tenant right. yeah. um, but it's not straightforward um, we haven't tested it with our legal team yet but they believe that they've got a solution that would mean that they would recoup at least some of their investment even if it became a right to buy property very quickly mm -hmm. I think <clears throat> yeah so just, I think there was a figure quoted of say 10,000 pounds for the conversion. I think Councillor Vassi mentioned 30,000 um, pounds. If, 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 if that's what it cost to the council to do this piece of um, retrofit, um, why could we not just add that to the, to the right to buy cost? So that at least you get your money. At least you get your money back from the, the from the amount that the the, the um, former tenant is paying. Sorry, Dennis. Uh, I, I think we can um, from memory, and again, I'd have to check um, for complete accuracy. It adds to what we call the cost floor. So any major investments that you've done on the property can be included in the offer price. On, on the right to buy from memory. Again, I need to absolutely double check that. But it's time limited, um, is my understanding. So it's not, it's not, that level doesn't last in perpetuity, if you see what I mean. I think from memory, again, from memory, I think it's about 15 years that applies for. So it's, it's something. Very good. Thank you. Just one question, observation for me. Um, <clears throat> in terms of, Things the council can control in terms of delivering the strategy. Is there anything in terms of supplementary planning documents that we can put in in terms of encouraging requiring new builds to be living up to these kind of aspirations? Yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah so uh, that would come. Yeah, yes, in terms of the uh, current local plan strategy that goes above current regulatory arrangements. Uh, and uh, executive have asked us to bring forward both a housing and a climate change SPD. Uh, and we'd love to pick up uh, this. You know, they clearly need to talk to each other. So that would be coming on, on the, over in that regard. Um, I just wanted just to touch upon some of the discussion in respect of uh, the comfort charge and the recovery of, of monies and investment opportunities, just to reflect that we're currently looking at uh, potentially uh, annual electricity bills and, and heating bills for, for domestic residences is going up from 1200 to 1600 pounds per annum is the sort of spot forecast for next year so it could be that you actually save 25 percent off a bill but actually because underlying energy prices go up the tenant doesn't save any money at all they're just warmer uh, and i think there is a there's a quite there's a an underlying issue that we've got to look at as officers but also as society is to how do you monetize this? Because it's intrinsically linked to the underlying cost of energy. And I think there is a, an interesting point that if you look at, for example, the uh, offshore wind farm, um, Honda 2, it's producing, I think, at, and Council of Asking, we have to maybe direct me this bit if I've got it wrong, but the figure is in somewhere in the order of about £38 per megawatt, which is 3.8 pence per kilowatt. So it's incredibly cheap, but actually, you pay the average pool price for energy at the time, and that includes effectively the price for gas. So that therefore, despite the fact that you're using electricity on air source heat pumps, you're actually paying the price of energy because it's an energy market. And therefore, if you're using air source heat pumps, actually, even if you've got a well-insulated home, the cost could go up. Uh, so again, it's just, I think we've just got to be very mindful that this is something that we've uh, rightly got to face as a societal challenge and how we pay for it is something I don't think anybody's really come to come up with an answer for. Uh, and clearly what we've seen in, even in today's uh, 
like large scale announcements from government is they're not a big enough scale and they're not they don't recognize the sheer scale and, it, and it's literally and it's interesting to say to understand that these are the first steps that have been taken and we're all on a very steep learning curve because again you know picking up council last's point we've, we've got to get on with it uh, but it is going to be a steep learning curve because we've not done it before okay thank you uh, do you want to respond to any of that andrew before we move on oh yeah just just briefly yeah um just to add to that the point about energy prices it is a really important one that we're really dependent on the government for um at the moment there's electricity prices but, um because they're so much higher than gas per kilowatt yeah it really sort of holds the heat pump market back now um part of the reason for that is that the um the tariffs that partly fund um, some of this energy efficient work, uh, energy efficiency work, they all get taken off electricity. So the government has committed to reviewing that with a view to rebalancing the electricity and gas um, price, which could which could actually be you know sort sounds really technical, but could be quite critical in in moving to, to heat pumps. But the timescale for that is potentially quite long. So that's really one to um, to keep an eye on. And just on the planning. Um, I think, yeah, that, that is something we're exploring around external wall insulation, which, you know, in terms of the second half, the sort of retrofit rather than the new build. Um, so that's that's an early stage. But of course, there is, there's planning implications to doing, you know, external wall insulation on properties. So it's certainly, you know, it's another, another important point to consider that. And it, it may be that when the housing supplementary planning document is um, is is done it may be something that scrutiny would want to have a have a look at um i'm pretty sure we would absolutely <laughs> uh, i mean would you like to make that a formal request let's, yeah? let's make it a yeah, formal if, you, request. if you'd like to make that a formal request we can make sure that when that's developed we unless anyone that. has any objections <laughs> wouldn't dream of it um okay um thank you for that that input members and thank you very much andrew and michael for for all the work you've done on that it's uh, it's really impressive okay we move on to agenda item seven uh, it's an update report on homeless winter night provision 2021-22 so who would like to introduce this dennis Hello again, everyone. Um, okay, so I'm, I'm not going to go through the report in detail. You'll be pleased to know, no doubt. I'll assume that you've read it. Um, uh, just to uh, pull out a couple of highlights, uh, though, uh, you will see that some of this chimes with the earlier reports that we had around uh, performance, um, the impact of COVID, and some of the responses for, uh, to that. Uh, by services and some of the ongoing impacts. Um, it's reduced uh, our traditional uh, numbers for uh, emergency winter provision from 29 to 14. Supplement that, uh, we've got uh, potentially an extra 13 units Ordnance Lane um, and uh, for, uh, for there um, with the new uh, pod um, that's going in there. And as we did, um, through the Everyone In initiative, um, there's the opportunity, if needed, to work with hotel partners um, in the city to, to provide accommodation. Um, we've kept our links with those uh, within the team, uh, which adds to the flexibility that we have across all of the services all year round. Um, I've also given you uh, an update on uh, the general homelessness services. Extremely busy, as you can see, for the reasons outlined there and discussed earlier. Um, we uh, successfully managed to carry people through on the Everyone In initiative uh, into accommodation. Obviously, our ability to move people on into more permanent accommodation is affected by the number of voids that we've got, whether they're in uh, supported accommodation for homeless families or for, um, for homeless uh, single people uh, and the resettlement process that comes with that. Um, I've given you some of the statistics around funding that we've got. 
um, which uh, continues to be time limited funding and gets renewed periodically. A couple of funding streams have been pushed together to give us the to total amount that we've got there of just over £560,000. There's a big push from um, homelessness services nationally to try and get that um, uh, uh, to a, a longer term footing. Um, that's not quite happened as, as yet, but government say that there is a long-term commitment to end rough sleeping uh, nationally, and that's something that we um, mirror locally as well. We've not had any um, decision on, on the amount of winter funding we've got. It's a small amount overall of £6,000 last year, so it's not, it's not going to make a huge difference. Um, I've also given you some statistics around um, people housed in the resettlement category were running at 29 as opposed to uh, 69 and 76 in the previous two years. So we've got some work to do there to get, get people through. Um, and um, just to highlight some of the significant uh, functions, as I think uh, Councillor Pavlovich alluded to earlier on, there are a lot of very, very desperate people out there in difficult situations that have been um hidden and exacerbated and contributed to by uh what's happened over the last sort of 18 months and what's happening now in some of the things that we've talked about around fuel poverty etc um we're not seeing a huge increase in presentations from um uh the private rental sector um we are seeing a a, 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 a a large number of presentations and of course our focus as a service is around prevention so we work with people through personal housing plans um, uh, to uh, keep them in accommodation wherever possible and where that fails we provide them with temporary accommodation and if accepted as homeless through on to, into more permanent accommodation which can be the council stock or our housing association partners um, we're quite successful in the private rental sector as well. So we do look at a range uh, and that's an area for, for expansion for us. Um, some other uh, more localised challenges are, uh, are things like probation service sending people unplanned directly to us, um, which doesn't help us. And that's not anything local. It's, uh, you know, with examples of, of uh, people come from the Scarborough area uh, because we've got a decent homelessness service um, that's an, an anecdotal uh, story there for you. I'm not saying that's a, a pattern, but it's just one anecdotal story for you there. Um, and we've um, continued to attract funding uh, whenever it becomes available from uh, um, a government. Uh, we've got, we're in the process of purchasing six uh, homes it's it's detailed in there and we've got some revenue funding to provide support around that and we're open up to two sort of shared houses fairly quickly uh fairly soon sorry um to supplement the resettlement pathway so hopefully that's a whistle stop to a, of where we're at at the moment and i'm happy to take any questions thank you very much <clears throat> members uh councillor hollier thanks Chair. It was really just about sort of around that paragraph 22 and um, sort of probation service sending people to York. Um, obviously jumped out a little bit, I guess, in a sense, it's just almost a sort of sign of success um, that you do get a sort of reputation that, that leads to that. But um, what, what I guess are they saying to people to, to send them to York? Um, that would be my first question. Yeah, so, so we work with everyone. Sorry, Sorry. apologies for that. Yeah, we'll work with everybody. Um, obviously, we're not, we're, we're not going to be bureaucratic about it. We're talking about people's lives here. Um, so we'll work with people and uh, 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 we will provide them with accommodation and support and advice. But we will have that conversation about them, about, about sort of returning to areas that they came from, as we do across homelessness services. Um, uh, ultimately, um, our job is to make sure that people are accommodated and safe, but we do have to be mindful of, uh, of, of the numbers of people coming, coming in um, to 
to York um, for those reasons. And we have robust conversations with, with, with the services that might uh, send them out where periodically this is an issue. It might be, it might be down to um, a, a small change in legislation or funding um, or, or a service um, having a change in personnel, for example. Um, uh, it's happened in the past with hospital discharge where people have turned up on an unplanned basis and we've worked with those services to um, uh, make sure that that doesn't happen long term. Um, but but we certainly, we certainly, what we certainly don't do is just to, if you're not from this area, off you go, or we're not going to provide you with a service. But obviously, um, we will, we will um, remind people of some of the duties that they have to work in a planned way with us um, and to utilise the local services. That, um, that should be available to them. <clears throat> you got a follow up? Yeah, just, just do we do we know what they say to the to the homeless people that they send? Do they say go to York because X, Y, and Z? You know, get on a train or hitchhike or drive or you know find some way of getting to York. But what are they saying to them that is the reason to go to York? I suppose rather than where they are at the moment. I can sort of imagine what it would be, but you know, what is the sort of push factor, I guess? Um, I don't know in, 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 in detail all, all of the conversations I had, but certainly when we're talking to people who arrive in this area, um, we will um, have, have the conversations about uh, why, they, why they are, where they're at. Um, and quite often they'll they'll be um, explaining that the, if services aren't available or accommodation isn't available locally, where accommodation and services might be available, um, and uh, and obviously we'll check those out. Um, and I wouldn't have put it in the report if there wasn't a substance in in that. Um, so I, I think uh, as we've talked about earlier. Public services are uh, under the cosh generally. I um, think um, it, 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 there is um, huge demand for some of the services that we that we have nationally. Um, and for the reasons I mentioned earlier, there might be service fallout as well. Um, so that's just a small uh, uh, example of, of patterns that we see all the time. As I say, it, it, you know, in a, if we sort this issue out, it might be hospital discharges or issues around men mental health in the future. Mm. Does that answer <clears throat> your question? Thank you, Dennis. Uh, Councillor Palovic. Thanks, Dennis. Um, uh, thanks, Chair, and thanks, Dennis. Um, th thanks for this report. Um, uh, just on your last comments about the probation service, obviously, as a former probation officer, uh, you know, I do find. It, it would be surprising, I'm not saying it hasn't happened, but it would be surprising given the way that court orders and prison sentences um, and licences are structured that they would send, uh, anybody from out of area would send anybody into another area when that would leave them liable for recall um, or um, being brought back to court for breaching their order. So, but I'm not saying it hasn't, I'm not saying it hasn't happened. Um, uh, in respect of the uh, rough sleeper numbers at the moment, um, obviously we're just about to have the annual street count. Uh, what's the current situation that you're aware of? Um, what are the numbers? Yeah, numbers are still very low um, around around um, the official last count was three. So they fluctuate week by week, as you well know. Um, we had a week, um, two or three weeks ago, where there were eight people no. that we'd identified. Um, so um, uh, obviously we, we're, we're straight onto them, uh, anybody who's sleeping rough. But the numbers are still very, very low compared to where where they were a couple of years ago, which was up around the late twenties. Mm. Um, thanks. So, if we've only got such low numbers, um, three, four, five, um, we seem to have one rough sleeper coordinator, four rough sleeper housing navigators, two meme workers, two outreach workers for the Salvation Army. 
two private rented sector offices, a mental health worker. We've just had £531,000 from the Rough Sleepers Initiative. Um, on the one hand, you could say, yes, four staff to every homeless person is, is a great um, resource. But uh, the other way of saying is, is it actually masking the reality of what they do? Sorry, that was a very leading question because I actually know what the answer is and I'm, I'm not trying to be cheeky because um, I know that the work that they do and it's brilliant, but I, I think it's useful if you explain that they do far more than just work with street sleepers. Yes, so, so most of the work that they do is, is when people are in service, um, and uh, and uh, as I mentioned earlier, we're, we're pretty successful at accessing, believe it or not, the private rented sector. I think in 2019, um, the, uh, as part of the winter provision, the Yes Below Zero service, which employed, uh, which engaged volunteers, um, um, 29 people came through that service over the winter period and we've got 17 directly into the private rented sector. So that's the sort of work that they'll do. It's not about just providing support directly to people. It's about helping them access to navigate their way through some of the systems that we have in the healthcare services that they might not have been accessing previously into uh, psychological therapies, into uh, other, other services, engaging with people like um, local area coordination, wherever it's needed. Um, and we're, doing, we're talking about people who quite often will go in and out of crises. So it's about helping people manage and support them appropriately through that. Very intensive working with some of the people that we deal with. I'll highlight um, uh, some of the work that we've done around the people that came in through um, the Everyone In initiative in particular. Uh, and from the housing uh, first uh, figures that you've got in, set in uh, paragraph 20, um, you'll see that the numbers were low uh, one, four, and five over the last three years, and appear to be low uh, this year at two. But um, if you look at the accompanying information, eight are agreed and awaiting accommodation. So that's double the number of last year. And I, I've got four on my desk waiting to be looked at by myself. Um, now, the work around that by those meme workers um, is absolutely intense in getting somebody uh, who cannot survive. Um, or, or live successfully in our supported accommodation to the point where they can go straight into a property um, with its own front door, with all the responsibilities that comes with that and survive and be supported well over, over a number of years. So that's where all that money goes really. Um, obviously we do, we are uh, very successful at engaging with people um, quickly when they appear to be uh, uh, rough sleeping or a, a threat of rough sleeping and that it's not the same people all the time there are new people getting into that situation so we do have to engage constantly with them and and uh, get them into service and get the help that they need does that hopefully that uh, mm. gives you an idea of, yeah. um, of the, of the, the extent of the work that goes on yeah. Thank you, Dennis. That's really helpful because I think it, it does help just to explain the work that the teams do. And, and, and that's one of the things that I did want to ask you about, people that are inadequately housed um, and the work that the council can do with those people who I, I, I think the, the colloquial term is sofa surfing or um, that have some nights potentially on the streets, some nights on a mate's floor, some nights traveling between different houses um, on a, a, almost on a rotational basis with whoever will take them, uh, whoever will take them in. What the, the you know, I know, I know the work that the teams do is how are we identifying those? And, and they are the hidden homeless, if you like. Yeah, so um, with the Homeless and Reduction Act came uh, what's known as a duty to refer for uh, partner organisations, whether it's police, social services, children's services, etc. So um, obviously, 
um, quite often the people you're talking about will be uh, experiencing other, other difficulties. So, you know, we do look to other services and it's a duty on those services to refer into other services. There's quite a lot of people in that position do, do come in. And as you say, if, if they do end up sleeping, we generally latch onto them fairly quickly and engage them in, in service. There will be some people that we don't don't see um, from, from that. And one of the one of the challenges that we have is how we how we reach them, how we identify uh, them. Uh, at, uh, so I've explained the sort of mechanisms where we where we can tap into that. But there's probably by definition going to be some people that that, that we can't can't reach. Um, you know, good information, good advice um, available to, to, to people. Um, we do have an underlying issue with the amount of uh, resources that we have a bit available to us, the amount of properties that we have available to us. But I think the, the report clearly demonstrates that we're constantly looking to expand the options that we have available to us, whether it's in the private rented sector, whether it's building in more affordable homes that people might move, move on to um, from council uh, uh, rented accommodation. Um, and in some of the sort of more specialist schemes that we've uh, that we've um, been able to uh, obtain funding for. Councillor Pavlovic. Yeah. Thanks, and I will shut up after this. Um, I was really impressed to see Crombie House being brought back um, into um, into operation. Um, one, can you explain what that's going to look like? Um, what the timescale for it is, and two, have you thought about that with any of the other um, former care homes that have been closed um, in recent years um, that could be potentially re, re brought back into scope until they they are then um, drawn into the housing delivery program? Yes, so we foc focused on uh, Crombie House. Uh, because that was the most viable to bring back online quickly. Um, my update today, we, we got it decorated. Um, we're purchasing the equipment that people, uh, the furniture and uh, other items that people need to, to, uh, to live uh, with, uh, and it should be open by the end of the week. So that's that's really good news for uh, the capacity that we have. We've looked at other buildings, the investment that it would uh, need to open them up in any realistic timescale is, is too much. But we're constantly looking for opportunities to expand the capacity that we have. We are using bed and breakfast, as I've outlined in the report at the moment. Excuse me, we try and minimise that, um, but we're always looking for, for opportunities to to do that because we have the recovery plan in place and um, uh, uh, I'm, I'm confident that with the focus on our void properties, um, we can free up some accommodation to get people moved on. Um, so hopefully we won't need any more accommodation apart from from the house, obviously, if that, like any plan, if it, do, if it doesn't work, we will, we will continue to explore the options um, and, you know, um, uh, look at a cost benefit analysis of some of the uh, facilities that we have, but at the moment it, it, it doesn't stack up for us to, um, to, to try and open those for this purpose. Thank you. Um, Councillor Vassi, the final question. Just a very quick one. It's just paragraph seven. Uh, you refer to the fact that uh, requests for service have gone from 80 a week uh, pre-pandemic to around 200. My question is really, are you expecting this to continue at this higher level or are you hoping that it would be dropping back down? Is it related to the pandemic? Um, just some clarity on this, on that figure. Um, some of it is, apologies. Um, some of it is, um, but there, as I indicated earlier, there is no one clear indicator or increase for, for any particular category. It's certainly not um, uh, uh, the people being evicted in the private rental sector. Um, there is an increase in, in all reasons. So whether it's what we call family license termination, so people being asked 
um, to leave home. I suppose if you've been cooped up for 18 months with the same people, there might be a bit of a fatigue there, shall we say. But, uh, you know, whether it's that, there's, there's you know, we've seen national um, information around domestic abuse, for example, um, that has an impact on, on, on where we're at. Um, there's no particular spike in any one area. There's just more of it across the board. I think that's some, something about the pent up demand that we've seen um, from from uh, the throughout the COVID period. Um, I'd like to think that some of it is is that people are more confident of coming forward and asking for help as well when when they're in difficult situations. But our what I will say is. Um, our clear focus is on is on prevention. So we will fight tooth and nail to keep people in properties where it's it's safe, settled accommodation, um, and, um, and 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 provide that advice through a robust personal housing plan, which is part of the legislation that's come in. Um, but the team are, are great at doing that and setting out um, what 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 the individuals and families involved need to do to help themselves improve the position as well as what the council can do for them as well. Um, and that's that's the basis that we operate on um, under very, very tight circumstances at the moment. Yeah. <clears throat> thank you, Dennis. Um, thank you, members, for your questions and thank you to you and your team for, for the work that you have you do and continue to do. And just to note, paragraph 23, um, thank you for the collecting and providing the inf information about um, LGBT plus service users, I think that's useful to have, and, and maybe in future years there's you know even more granular information in terms of um, ethnicity, gender identity, etc. So that it's it's really helpful to to have that. So thank you for that. Okay, um, gender I to make the work plan is as published. Um, we've added a penciled in a couple. Um, of issues to return to in, in next April's public meeting, which is an update on where we are with, with housing services and um, decent homes. And by then, the new ICT system will be, fingers crossed, <laughs> in operation. So you can tell us about that as well. Um, but we'll keep the work plan under review, obviously, if, if any issues come up in the, in the meantime. Um, there are no items of urgent business. Um, there was an urgent item of business, but we, we dealt with it. Um, <clears throat> it. It's been a long meeting, so thank you for your patience. But I think because we have public meetings relatively infrequently, it is important that we um, we discuss as much in public as possible. And there were some important and quite chunky items that we had to go through tonight. But thank you for your participation and your patience. and. Uh, Enjoy what's left of this evening. Good night.